Anything we do that is designed to kill our chance of survival, it is going to instinctively make us feel shit. These emotions of depression and anxiety are coming into us all as messages. If we carry on down this path, we're all going to be fine. Neuroscientist TJ Power. He wants to help us rebalance our brain chemistry. Modern life has hacked our dopamine, creating a generation of phone addicts. We get asked all the time, like, I need to be motivated more. How can I be more motivated? Dopamine is literally the entire controller of motivation. Dopamine is the main chemical we're really messing up in the modern world. That is the one we're all abusing. One of the absolute best behaviors for dopamine. And if you look at any high performing, like positive, happy human, they've always nailed down their evenings and their mornings. And if you change that system, big shifts then happen with the rest of your life. Those like the first couple of steps that somebody should take. 100% goal number one is like, if the whole world could just go camping this weekend without their phone, <laughs> the world would be a different place next week. Like, if you could give someone like five simple steps to unfuck their life. That's a good question. So, this evening. Hi, I'm Jamie. And I'm Stacey. And this is the Body Smart Podcast. And we've got a super fascinating episode for you today because we are joined by neuroscientist and entrepreneur TJ Powers. And TJ is here to talk to us about not only how the brain works, but also how we can be making the most of our mental well-being in a digitally challenging environment that we're in today. And we're going to get into the nitty gritty of things like dopamine, serotonin, endorphins, all of these chemicals you might have heard about. But TJ is really great at putting it into like real practical language of what does that mean and what can you actually do about it? So um, it's probably a good place to start. What are all those fancy words that I just said? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guys. And... Yeah, there's kind of four main chemicals. We have dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins. Each of these four chemicals basically evolved in our brain over the last 300,000 years to help humans just survive and thrive as a species. Each of them is getting hit pretty hard by the modern world. And if we learn what their function is and then how we can boost them, we experience big transformations. And so what, act what actually are they? Are they hormones? Are they neurotransmitters? Or Though They are neurotransmitters. That would be the best word for them. They're chemicals predominantly living within our brain. Serotonin is the one that lives within our body. And they effectively transfer information around our body depending on the actions that we're taking. So if we were to go into like each one of them, could you give like a brief uh, explanation or description of them? Definitely. So dopamine basically evolved within us to give us the drive and the desire to do the hard things that were going to mm. keep us alive. So we had to hunt for food, build shelter, find new places to live. And we needed something that would reward effort effectively so that we wanted to put effort into our lives. And any time in our life that we complete any kind of challenging activity, making our bed, completing a work assignment, losing weight, anything that's like an effortful action for our brain, dopamine motivates us, motivates us to do it and then kicks in in our brain to reward us so that we think, okay, let's keep doing this. Let's keep doing this. Mm -hmm. So like why you feel, is that, that's one of the reasons maybe why you feel so good after a workout? Yeah, it's a, yeah, it is a significant reason. Exercise is interesting because it also then hits endorphins, which is like designed to actually help us cope with physical and psychological stress. Mm -hmm. So anytime like as a hunter-gatherer, we were in like really physically challenging environments, suddenly endorphins would come in and they would de-stress our brain. And when you complete a workout, you're getting this big dopamine reward for the effort you're putting in, mm -hmm. but you're also getting a big de-stressing endorphin effect as well. Oh, so it's a double, double win. Double. And if you did it with people and you had like connection, you'd get oxytocin from it as well. So I and if know did, why uh, CrossFit's so popular then. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure. So is that, is that why like a, a group classes could be even more effective because you, you, you're taking three out of the four there? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So oxytocin's here to connect humanity together effectively. And and like even things like high fiving each other, you're then getting an oxytocin boost. If you were then outside as well and got getting some sunlight mm -hmm. at the same time for some of those kind of workouts, then you'd hit serotonin. So then you'd be getting a full dose, that DOSE of chemicals in that kind of environment. So move to California, do CrossFit. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's how we're going to tick them all every day. Yeah. I mean, that yeah. would definitely help. I mean, yeah. We literally yeah. spent 300,000 years running around in groups, exercising in the sunlight. So yeah. like, if the more we like engage with what humans did, the better we feel. And and so like I am, um, a, a lot of that then, like a lot of the things you're talking about 300,000 years ago, yeah. that's how our bodies and physiology has evolved. Yeah. But it's not, it's very different to how we live today, you know, in 2024. And that's what I believe is causing all of the mental health challenges we're seeing. Like if someone's going through a really cha challenging period in their life, if they were going through grief or like a breakup or something, that's like a genuine thing that could cause like a mental health difficulty. But if you just kind of feel depressed, but don't know why, or you feel anxious and don't know why, it's very likely there's a chemical imbalance occurring mm. in your brain. 
And these four chemicals didn't evolve for us to all hang out how we hang out now. They evolved right. for us to live that kind of lifestyle. And in this modern world, they're all like, what's going on? What's going on? And they're dropping mm. in their levels. And then when they drop, they send us a message making us feel quite crap to try and say, boost me back up, boost me back up. That's what like a hangover is, for example, when you drink. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, cause I've seen that like a theater. So you should never try and do like two nights in a row because you'll never get, <laughs> you'll basically never get the same peak that you had the night before 100%. because you've basically like depleted a lot of these sort of chemicals. Yeah. Actually, well, if you yeah. started at zero on a night out and then you boomed your dopamine's like a hundred, it would yeah. crash below zero significantly the next day down to like minus 50. And then the next day you try and get drunk and get a high again. And then suddenly you're not able to climb because you're coming from a lower place. Right. So you're not going to get as high peak. Either. Yeah. Yeah. So is, is, do you really see uh, dopamine or maybe some of these other chemicals as like a, like a bar almost? Because I've heard before the saying that uh, dopamine is renewable but not infinite. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just like it will come back, yeah. but it's not just something that you can just keep abusing. Um, yeah. So is, so yeah, like a, just like more of an explanation on that. Each of the chemical has its own baseline level within mm -hmm. your brain and body. So it's all sitting there. We've all got our own baselines depending on our genetics and lifestyles and stuff like that. And they can alter if we do more of the good things or if we do more of the bad things, they'll go up and down. And yeah, something like dopamine, if you really crashed alley, had a massive night drinking loads of alcohol, over the next few days, regardless of what you do, as long as you don't do any more alcohol, mm. it will naturally begin to regenerate itself. Because yeah. you're having to do stuff. You're having to at least walk around and you have to engage yeah. some effort and it will regenerate itself. It can go back up as you do these things. But then there's more efficient ways to make it regenerate. Something like cold water immersion has been super popular mm -hmm. over the last few years, partly because it creates this massive generation of dopamine. I've got, I've got a question on that because I've done a year, I've done like a year of, of cold therapy every single day. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, Feeling like, motivated? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I've I done the, the uh, baths uh, for the majority of it. Yeah. And then like uh, I just basically do the, the showers now. Yeah. Um, but I've, hit, I've, I've gone back and forth about like, like the cold showers are nowhere near as bad. Like, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like it's, it doesn't feel like as, as, but sometimes when you do like the three Celsius, yeah, you know, that's ice intense. Pass. Yeah, it's intense. Like my bones feel like they hurt when I get mm -hmm. out. Um, but is that good to be doing on a on a like a daily basis? You know, like there's a mm. part of me that's like, hmm, am I abusing dopamine there to an extent? Because I feel, I mean, I feel amazing, but I'm like, I probably was also like three minutes away from dying as well. <laughs> so you know, there's is the is the a side of that where it's possibly, yeah, I I think the cold water. Immersion definitely can go too far and mm -hmm. you can definitely go too cold. Like, yeah. because also in that environment, your stress hormone cortisol is going to fire hard because it's like, what the hell is going on? Why am I suddenly in this? And over releasing that cortisol hormone is not going to be good for us. So nice. I would actually lean towards just like a daily having your normal warm shower and finishing with cold for like 30 to 60 seconds mm -hmm. and cold enough where you're like, that's pretty cold, but yeah. not like, oh my God, I'm going to die in this shower. Yeah, yeah. And that would provide like, provide like a nice dopamine release. But I definitely think you could overstress the body with too much. Cold. Right. Yeah. Like if you're getting in a sauna that was like 120 degrees, that would not be good. But like a nice 70, 80 degree sauna. Is it, can, be it, can, good. it can put stress on the body, but not too much stress to an extent. I guess yeah. that's a, you could almost say the same with like workouts as well. Yeah. Like you can do high intensity workouts, but you can push it too far as well with the workouts where it can take the body days. Yeah, you can over cover. bang the cortisol while yeah. training mm -hmm. as well. And then yeah. you can get super physically burnt out and stuff like that. And yeah. there's like a good balance with working out. There's definitely a good balance yeah, with the yeah. cold. So uh, what are, um, because this is, I, I kind of see my own side of this in terms of where people like abuse and maybe like dopamine or serotonin or some of the chemicals that you've just, uh, yeah. uh, what, what do you see as like day to day now that like people are in a negative way impacting these sort of four chemicals? Yeah, I think dopamine is the main chemical we're really messing up in the modern world. It's the only one that we basically develop the capacity to hijack and like really influence. Something like oxytocin, you can't really do something that's going to like spike it in a fake way. Whereas dopamine, over the last few hundred years, we invented cigarettes and porn and alcohol and vaping and sugar and all these kind of things, mm. social media. And that is the one we're all abusing. And our brain is so instinctively designed to crave dopamine. Like it was so important for hunter gatherers that they every day woke up, better shelter, more food, better shelter, more food, so that mm -hmm. we could live the last 300,000 years and get here. And 
we all wake up with this instinctive craving for dopamine. And then really, if there wasn't the phone, for example, to go on, we'd all be like, right, let's take some action. Let's go have my shower and get ready and like do something with my day. But now there's this option of this device that can give us what we think we want. Mm. And then it gives us this massive dopamine spike. And we all like, we get so addicted to that repetition. And then immediately from the beginning of the day, we crash the dopamine. And then we're on like this uphill motivation mm. battle to do our work, to eat good, to work out, all that kind of stuff. So, can you just explain that crash though? Because you said you spike it. So, mm. so at what point does it crash? Because if I know if I'm scrolling for a while, it just, after a while, it's just like, you realize you've been there for an hour and you're just numb. Mm -hmm. So is there like a time limit or like how does it work where it just stops boosting the dopamine? Yeah, so for I, I for like something like short videos, which is the main thing we're all hooked on and all create and stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the irony yeah. is so funny. Yeah. And But this is the good stuff. So this is yeah. good for your dopamine, everyone. But uh, <laughs> Short videos, you'd be maxing your brain at about 20 minutes. About 20 minutes, your dopamine is gonna have been taken so high that it's gonna to begin to like just fall off a cliff effectively. Oh, so there's like a threshold that you can tolerate kind of. Yeah, to an extent. Like it would definitely be better if you're gonna watch short videos to give yourself like five or 10 minutes. Just like you could take a bit of sugar into your body, but you don't want like 20 grams of it, 30 grams of it or something. So there's, yeah, an upper bound of what your brain's gonna be able to deal with. And the whole thing with dopamine is that it's designed that it should slowly increase in your brain. Like if we were actually hunting or looking for food, foraging, anything like that, it would take like three hours to find that animal, dopamine slowly rise, slowly rise, and then slowly fall back down once we've got it. And the whole challenge is that as soon as you enter TikTok, for example, dopamine reaches beyond what even hunting an animal would give us in our brain. And then suddenly the brain's like, how the fuck, oh, sorry, I shouldn't say that. How, yeah, how, you can try. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How, how yeah. the fuck did I get up there? Yeah. Yeah. And... Uh, then it goes through the process of seeking balance, that whole homeostasis thing. Just right. like when with like glucose and sugar and stuff like that, these <clears> curves <throat> work the same and then it crashes super hard and then you're on mm. this climb back. So that's, that's gonna be like, I've, we've said this several times, I stopped going on my phone in the first hour of the day, yeah. about five, six years ago, because I was literally waking up and in this really reactive state of like, oh, I've got to reply back to messages. Yeah. And before my eyes would even open, I'm trying to reply to messages and I'm looking on social media. Yeah. And since I stopped that, it's just been, like it's like like, like literally life changing um, compared to how I used to feel. And then I get up, I do a cold shower, I do a workout, and that's probably like the first ninety minutes of my day. So I'm, yeah, that's uh, transformational compared yeah. to like how most of us start our days. Yeah. So it's and and it's, so that's from a dopamine standpoint. My dopamine levels, what when I wake up, are going to be at a certain level. And then mm. am I doing things to get them high, higher or the bar bigger? Like what's how does that work? You can kind of visualize it like this throughout the night. Part of the regenerative process of sleep is we're building some dopamine. We also build serotonin while we're sleeping. Dopamine basically lives in our brain as in these things called vesicles, which you can imagine is literally like a little bubble. Mm -hmm. Any time in which you engage like effortful action, your brain literally generates these bubbles within the brain in order to build the dopamine so we have more and more drive, more and more drive. When we engage in something like the phone, as soon as we start scrolling that feed, those bubbles effectively start bursting. And whilst that would feel pleasurable, because, oh, nice, it's really pleasurable as I scroll, you're then depleting the quantity within your brain. Whereas when you, say, start the day and you do avoid your phone, you make your bed, you do your workout, you're cold, whatever it may be, you're generating a ton more of those bubbles. And then you sit down to work and you're like, nice, I can actually do this work. I have the drive to do it. Mm -hmm. I'm not procrastinating because I've got dopamine in my brain. And I can focus because I've got dopamine in my brain. So it's very different how that day mm. begins and the quantity of bubbles sitting there in your brain is going right. to impact things. So that, that could actually <clears throat> really positively affect like going in and like having your to-do list mm -hmm. and having those first couple of big tasks that you want to get in. If you do those more difficult tasks of the morning, you've, you're have you basically going to have more motivation because that's a, that's a key word that we get asked all the time. Like, I need to be motivated more. How can I be more motivated? If mm -hmm. you do that, you're then going to be more motivated going into the day. 100%. Dopamine is literally the entire controller of motivation. Like it do, if you if you took dopamine out of brain, immediately you're in apathy. You can't even like walk or move. Like dopamine is what creates all of our ability to do things and move forward. And if you take something like that, for example, one of the absolute best behaviors for dopamine is what we call flow state, which is just like when a human gets really, really deeply focused on a task. Can happen in your work, it can happen when you're playing a musical instrument, sport, whatever it might be. But if your brain 100% focuses on something and enters flow state, which takes about 15 minutes of focusing on a task to then enter flow mm. state. That's why the beginning is hard because your brain's generating dopamine on a task. And then suddenly you're like, oh, I'm kind of into this now and I'm working at pace. That happens because you're entering flow state. And 
in the morning, for example, I have this phrase in my head that I kind of like repeat as a mantra where I say straight to flow state, straight to flow state all morning when I'm on my walk and stuff. So that when I come home, I don't go on Instagram and like crash myself out. I try and go straight into a task that I need to get into flow state on yep. for me, like generating like slides for visual experiences or whatever it might be. And then if I complete that task, I then get an extra ton of dopamine in my brain and create completing all the bullshit tasks that you also have to do in your day becomes much easier. Mm. Like procrastination only occurs because you're low in dopamine. Wow. Like if, Interesting. If, you're, yeah. if you like can't, like you can't take action when you're procrastinating. And then like whilst we're procrastinating, we're scrolling our phones, which is making it lower and lower and we're getting further and further away from the place that actually mm. would lead you to take action. Also, here's one then. What should you do if you feel procrastination coming along? Yeah, that's a good question. So the phone has to leave your hand. Like that is 100% goal number one is like the phone goes down, preferably airplane mode it, get it physically away from you, like into another room. Then I would actually say the next best step would be to start organizing your environment. It's not actually to do the task itself. So like, say, for example, your desk environment, it might be like declutter it in some way, like bin some crap that's sitting on your desk. Then once you've kind of begun to declutter, it would be what is the task I'm about to complete? So like maybe it's writing a list of the three main things that are required to complete that task. Because all of these little things, the decluttering and a bit of like action for your brain isn't as hard as the task itself, which is going to require quite a lot of dopamine. But the little bits of effort you're putting in are beginning to build it when you've been in this crashed out phone scrolling place. So you declutter, then you like begin to plan the task and then you try and zone in. It's and like you, a warm up. It's like a warm up, effectively. <laughs> you like warming up in, in the gym, but for your brain, effectively. That's, and that's, a, that's a great like strategy though, isn't it? Because you, you can feel sometimes if you are procrastinating. So like having a few of those strategies to be like, right, let's start a warm up process to then get into yeah. the task. Especially yeah. with the, I like the idea of writing the three things that you need to think about because I know, for example, if I've got like a creative task set, Sometimes I'm like, oh, I've just got mind blank. Mm -hmm. And so I procrastinate like crazy. But actually, even just that logical, what three things do I even think about can open those doors in your brain. So and the beginning of any task is really difficult because our, our attention is designed to work as like broad and narrow attention. So like whilst you're walking through a forest, if you didn't have something you were specifically trying to do, our attention is designed to be laser focused on basically everything. So it's like constantly assessing. And then if we decided we were going to hunt, our attention could progressively narrow into one task. But it does take about 15 minutes for it to narrow itself down. And that's why in the start of any task, whilst you're doing it, you're constantly like, oh, I might pick up my phone. I might go on my email. I might go on Slack. And you're constantly moving. But eventually your brain will get locked in. And what I always do, so I pick the task. I've got the list of things I'm going to try and do. I then go on a new tab on Google and go on a stopwatch. Phone's in another room, so you can't use that as your stopwatch. I go on a stopwatch and I click start. And like I make this contract with myself that no matter what, I have to get that stopwatch to 15 minutes before I can go on to another thing. And I say to myself, if I do 15, I am allowed to change. But once you, and so like you realistically, what happens is you click start on the stopwatch, you do a bit, you think, fuck this, this is boring. And then you go back onto the stopwatch and you see it says one minute, 17 <laughs> seconds. And you're like, shit, that's all I managed to do. And I, you, if you battle your way through that first 15 minutes, just like battling the first like 15 minutes of a workout is often the hardest bit. Then you start thinking, oh, actually I'm in now. Yeah. I may as well mm. keep going. That is interesting because that's actually a technique I use with clients is if you don't want to do a workout, just promise yourself to do 15 minutes. Yeah. I didn't know there was some science behind yeah. it. Yeah, that's <laughs> both the flow state 100%. Yeah, because yeah, genuinely after 15 minutes, I mean, I very, very rarely then go, nah. I'm like, yeah, yeah all right, yeah, okay, I'm in. Because your brain is literally building the chemical that rewards you for the effort. So then you, you're like, your whole psychological process on it starts changing because your brain's like, oh, actually, no, this is pretty useful for me. Now I'm going to make sure they feel good mm -hmm. so they keep doing it. It's, nice. it. I think it's also in, like important to know that like it's good for you. Mm -hmm. So um, I was trying to like educate my dad about this a little bit because he goes swimming Monday through Thursday. And he says, like, I hate going swimming. I don't like going. He goes, every time I leave on Thursday, Thursday morning after he's been, he's like, oh, I just feel so good because I know I don't have to do it again until Monday. And, I'm, <laughs> you know, and he's like, and he's, your dad is hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I said, that's good for you. The fact that you're showing up and doing something that's physically challenging and the fact that you don't want to do it, but you do it every week. And then I was like, that's why you feel so great on Thursday when you finish. He's like, he's playing golf on Friday. So he enjoys that. But it's like, I said, it's a, that's a good um habit to have uh, and i was like try view it like a little bit more positive like you're you know you're keeping your brain basically in a healthy place by doing things that you don't want to but you know are good for you um and, and it's I so important to frame things like that because mm -hmm. 
it actually can impact how good it is for you if yeah. you start thinking like there's a yeah. whole reason that concept called placebo is a thing because like if people take drugs thinking that it's going to do something change can happen and if you're doing a behavior telling yourself this is good for me it can make it better for you and you mm -hmm. get a bigger dopamine release from it and i even did a video yesterday on instagram where i was saying that all the annoying shit we have to do around our house like taking bins out, emptying dishwashers, cleaning, wiping surfaces, all that discipline in your home is so good for your mm. dopamine system because it's just effortful action. And that video resonated really well yesterday. And it's because we've all got to do all that crap anyway. However, if you start thinking of this as something as, oh, this is good that I'm doing this rather than, oh, it's so annoying I have to clean my house. It like yeah. shifts the idea of it, of what it mm. is in your head. Then you're getting dopamine hits from it and you start feeling more motivated. Yeah. So, so should we do 15 minutes of cleaning as well? <laughs> I mean, that would be good. 15 minutes yeah. of cleaning would be so good. And like, I have like basic rules in my head where I normally will go on Instagram about 3 p.m., like in the afternoon. That would be like when I would post, for example. And then I don't allow myself back on Instagram until my dinner is cleaned up. That's like this like baseline rule I have. So then I eat my dinner and then I know I'm not allowed to go and get that dopamine hit until it's cleaned up. And then it's just like frameworks whereby, okay, so I have to get it cleaned up. Then you sit on the sofa and you get to have your scrolling session and it's like guilt free because you've taken action. So, so I am, um, just because obviously for people listening and I think, I think just so you fu fully get it, like what would be the difference of, say what you just said there, where you're really limiting your time of like how you basically spend your dopamine. Yeah. Um, and I'm being very intentional about it and you're doing that because you want to feel the best or you want to feel motivated. Like what's, like how do you feel in comparison to maybe somebody who abuses dopamine? Like what's going to be the contrast there? I would say the best emotion to identify with as to know how the dopamine is feeling is effectively how excited you're feeling about the time you're spending in your life. Because if you take, for example, your average feeling when you wake up on a Thursday or a Friday, you might feel like a little bit more excited about life than compa in comparison to how you wake up feeling on a Monday morning. And the whole world often thinks that's because oh, it's the end of the week is coming. So obviously, I feel great on Fridays. In reality, what happens is Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we all absolutely annihilate our dopamine with alcohol and sugar and porn and TV. And we all just like crash our dopamine all weekend. <laughs> we wake up on Monday mornings all with low dopamine thinking, oh, I hate my job and all that sort of stuff. But it's actually low dopamine. That's what's mm. causing that experience in your brain. And then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, life is much more effort. Work is effort. Helping with the kids is effort. All that kind of stuff is effort. Dopamine rebuilds itself throughout the week. And then we're like, oh, I feel quite good on Thursdays and Fridays. And it's so important, that emotion of, do I feel excited about life or is life feeling quite like flat and depressing and not very mm. exciting? That's how you know where your dopamine level is at. And right. for me, I like that feeling. I like the feeling of like, yeah, life feels exciting. Mm. Life feels fun. Well, definitely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, why would you not? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like, what do people really need to like pay attention to, I guess? Because that's like, that's the, if people think it's your time sometimes, whatever, I believe it's more like your attention. It's where you're placing your attention. So what do people need to pay more attention on to feel more excited about? I guess they're like day-to-day -day lives because it does come with some of those, what people class as more boring tasks. Yeah. You know, it's not scrolling on TikTok and watching a really funny video. It's Discipline making your bed. Basically. Yeah, being a bit more disciplined around the stuff that you do. Yeah, I would say, I would say with dopamine, the most important thing is how the day is beginning. I would say that's the most important thing to focus on because as I said, when our brain wakes up, it, it craves dopamine. Whatever is its first dopamine hit, it's going to instinctively crave in that direction for the rest of the day. So if it gets its first hit from effort, it's going to crave effort. If it gets its first hit from something really easy, like a vape or social media or like a sugary cereal breakfast, something like that, it's going to be like really primed to want mm. that crap. So if you can go by this rule, by like you, you need to wake up, immediately get out of bed and go and brush your teeth because like we're all seeking for like a dopamine hit and that will actually give you a dopamine hit the concentration and effort of brushing your teeth brush your teeth cold water on your face go back and make your bed and then i really think this framework of having to see sunlight before you see social media is like a good rule in your head so i have mm -hmm. to go outside even if it's just for a few minutes look at the sun even if it's cloudy which probably is and <laughs> especially in the uk yeah <laughs> and uh yeah then come back in. And if that day starts with like the dopamine's on the rise, then like all the other actions you take are going to be different. Mm -hmm. But if the day starts in like a pretty crap way, which yeah. like it does for most of us. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to understand with this stuff. I'm really not coming from the perspective of someone that has just been like super healthy and like locked in my whole life. I was like super screwed for like 10 years, addiction to drugs and partying and alcohol and my phone and porn and sugar, all that sort of stuff. And it was really how my day began that then had a cascading effect on everything else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you mentioned a few times there about sugar. Mm. Is Are there certain foods that have more of an effect on these chemicals? Yeah, uh, the UPFs, like all these ultra-processed foods, 
all these companies that you have neuroscientists like myself sitting in the lab, scanning the brain and assessing what chemical compound process is going to lead to the greatest dopamine spike. And that is why, like, when you eat a Pringle, you think, oh, my God, I want that whole fucking box because it creates this massive dopamine elevation. So anything where you look at the back of, back of the thing, you look at the ingredients and there's 50 words you can't say out loud, like, those are very designed to create massive dopamine mm -hmm. spikes and then become, like, really irresistible. Because we do get clients, um, you know, say, oh, I'm addicted to sugar. And I'm pretty sure it was you that have said this before. Are you addicted to sugar, though, because you wouldn't just eat a tablespoon full of sugar granules? Interesting. <laughs> like, you wouldn't, would you? You mm. wouldn't be like, oh, yeah, give me more. It's what those foods contain is sugar, but it's not necessarily the sugar, maybe? Yeah, I think sugar, also fats in these kind of foods, diff different parts of it. Protein would never be, like, super addictive. So it's probably more the fat carbohydrate, like, compound together that's being carefully designed to be yeah. addictive for sure. And then you mentioned about like the spikes and crashes and mm -hmm. that sounds like, you know, sugar spikes and crashes. And is that why you get in this cycle of like addictive eating or like almost mm. emotional eating? Because you feel a bit low and then you know you get that hit again. Yeah, dopamine, it feels so good when our dopamine level is elevated. It makes our brain really present and focused and it like completely like cuts us from all of our ruminative thinking. And if you were oh. really worried about something, and then suddenly you have like a glass of wine. You suddenly notice like, oh, I feel really good suddenly. Or like you scroll your phone and suddenly you feel really good because all the thoughts you're worrying about disappear because this dopamine elevates in your brain. And with something like addictive eating and stuff like that, if you're feeling really low and then you eat sugar, temporarily you're going to make yourself feel great and the sad emotion is going to leave just because of chemicals in your brain. But unfortunately, yeah, it does go through the crash. And then the low emotion is going to come back harder and harder and harder. Yeah, in that's so interesting because... So many clients that struggled with binge eating have said, you know, my brain goes quiet when I'm eating. Mm. And that makes it literally a lot of sense. does. Like ruminative thinking takes place like more in the center of our brain. When the dopamine elevates, the front of your brain gets super active mm. because it really thinks, oh, I'm hunting for an animal right now or I'm like building mm. shelter or I'm really present, like helping my kid or whatever it might be. That's what it believes is happening because suddenly there's this massive elevation of dopamine. And when our earth was being created, like it didn't foresee us necessarily having these like fake ways to yeah. access these experiences. So actually, if someone has that craving of like, oh, I just I just want some peace. So I'm just going to eat a bag of Haribo. Actually, there's a whole bunch of other things they could do to give the dopamine like a, a healthy dopamine hit. Right. Yes. So uh, what would you recommend? Interestingly, if someone just that example you give there, someone just wanted peace in their brain. I would actually chase serotonin if you wanted peace, which actually then like diverts into a different chemical because dopamine is like this motivation action chemical, feels really good, productive, that kind of thing. Serotonin is a much more calming chemical for our brain. And we've kind of got hooked on our like dopamine solves our problems when really it's like basically creating them all, all this <laughs> stuff. And serotonin, this is the chemical, it's really responsible for your mood, your emotional state, how calm your body is going to feel. 90% of it's being manufactured in our gut. And then we have a really clever system, this vagus nerve system, connecting our brain and body together, assessing the state of the gut. If things are great down there, then suddenly our brain is going to feel much calmer. And anything that's things like nature, sunlight, healthy food, resting on a sofa and closing your eyes, anything like that in that state where you're feeling crap is actually going to be much better for you than just chasing more of the oh, dopamine. Oh, really? Yeah. So you are you might be seeking like that, that bit of a buzz, a bit of a high, but actually maybe going for a walk mm. might be the thing. 100%. And it's really important to understand we've got addicted to like quick fixing the problem where like we think oh, if I eat this sugar, like at least the problem's going to be gone immediately. But then it just keeps making the problem much worse. But there has to be some kind of mind sh mindset shift that like sometimes the problem won't solve immediately. But if you want the problem completely gone, it's better to take a slower approach to getting rid of it. Like mm -hmm. I have this specific walk I'll do if I'm just feeling like shit, like I am vulnerable to like mental health challenges. I, sometimes I feel like depressed or I feel like anxious about something. And although the thought of going for a quiet walk in my head, like without distraction sounds like the worst thing ever. I know if I force myself around that hour walk and just like deal with all the crap that my head is saying, it will mean the problem is likely gone tomorrow. Whereas if I just like engage loads of sugar, that problem is definitely coming back tomorrow. So mm -hmm. it's like a mindset shift of can't get rid of it immediately, but I could get rid of it altogether if I take a slower approach. Mm -hmm. So it's not putting a sticking plaster on, it's actually dealing actually with it. Actually solving it, yeah. Yeah, nice. Where would you say it's best for someone to start who maybe is feeling like this, to feeling like demotivated, mm -hmm. procrastinate, pro procrastinating a lot, and can resonate with a lot of what's being said, but it's just like, again, the barrier 
to start and where this feels so hard. So like, what are like the first couple of steps that somebody should take? The first thing is a state of acceptance of what is the main cause of your low dopamine levels. Like you have to at least get your brain to acknowledge what it is. And like the, the kind of things that would be doing this, it'd be porn, sugar, social media, alcohol, vaping, or mm. online shopping. And whichever one of those, your brain, like if you're listening, your brain was like, yeah, I am nailing that thing, to be honest. I do eat loads of sugar or I'm watching porn every night or whatever it might be. You have to just take a second to just be honest with yourself and think, is this thing actually advancing my life and making me feel good overall? Or is this likely the cause of why I'm feeling so shit? And it's hard to do that. Like, mm -hmm. I accept that. Like, I was super hooked on drugs and alcohol. It's really, really hard for me to accept that. But ultimately, that moment is then when things can begin to shift. And with that, it's then like figuring out a realistic, quite short-term game plan of how am I going to have a few days where I engage with that thing significantly mm -hmm. less. And the only way out of all these addictive behaviors, and we see addiction as such like a strong word, like addicts that are like really struggling. But like we are all addicts now, like 100%. We're yeah. addicted to everything. And it's trying to go through like a little period where the behavior is really not engaged with. If the social media was the addiction, it would be trying from when you listen to this podcast, say it's 10 a.m., got to try and get to 10 a.m. tomorrow without clicking one of the apps. Like mm. Your brain needs to experience what it's like to not engage with the behavior. And naturally, whilst you're doing that, if you can be thinking, what are some good things I do, could do? Like, could I get into nature, eat some healthy food, do some cooking, clean my home, call a friend that I haven't connected to with a bit mm. for a bit? Something that's going to give you a positive experience in your brain and then like use that as like a yeah. platform to go from. Yeah. It's, it's, I think it's... It's just wild, isn't it, that life has become so comfortable now that mm. we have to, like, intentionally do hard things because life is so easy. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, life actually used to be hard. So and hard. It, yeah. Like, like, unimaginably hard. Mm. We, yeah. we, me and my girlfriend watched this show called Primal Survivor of this guy <laughs> going and visiting all the hunter-gatherer tribes that are still mm. in operation now in Africa and South America and stuff like that. And every single thing they do is so much effort. Even preparing the arrows for the hunt takes them about 90 minutes of like carefully crafting it. And like our brain is completely designed for so much effort. Mm -hmm. And yeah. now we have like no effort. And it's like we, 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 we complain if the, the waiter doesn't bring the meal over within the, the like 30 yeah. minutes. You We're know like what I mean? Our food, our food doesn't come. Yeah, you know, it's. It is. It's it's wild, isn't it? And yeah. Yeah, you kind of can see how we've we've got here because time is is what everyone views as their greatest sort of. Uh, commodity to an extent or your, your greatest resource is your time so anything that can save you time you value immensely mm. but like we've just gone down this like path of like comfort 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 and now it's it's almost coming we've full almost circle. like short sold ourselves because actually taking the long route to things as we talk about often is the more rewarding so it's not necessarily yeah. the efficient like but time saving our, way that's but our brains are just completely not wired for that we are wired to seek comfort to an extent mm -hmm. because if we if we like because we'd have to expend so much energy typically that if we could rest and recover and over overeat, that would make more sense. Actually, that's yeah. really interesting because there is a very strong human urge to just find the path of least resistance as well, isn't there? But yeah. there's also all this that we're talking about today on the other side of the fence. Technology has just tipped us over to the other side. We've spent 300 years, 300,000 years trying to figure out the most efficient way. And then in the last 50, we actually figured it out. And now we've, <laughs> we've tipped it. Screwed and, it. And now we've got, we got into this like inaction type yeah. state in our head. And it's really important to understand like why this is actually making us feel so shit. Because all our brain is designed to do is try and stay alive. That's like at the core of why we're here. It's just like stay alive, procreate. Like that's so humans continue mm. to be a species. And anything that we do that is in alignment to procreation and survival, our brain is instinctively designed to reward that behavior. Whether it's when we got healthy food into our body, water into our body, we rested our body, we connected, we had sex, anything was designed to reward the behavior. Anything we do that is designed to kill our chance of survival, like for example, if you compare watching porn to having sex, one of them is not procreation, it's literally the opposite and will reduce it as a society. Mm -hmm. And one of them creates more humans our brain is so intelligent and knowing future survival and anything that's going to reduce that likelihood is going to instinctively make us feel shit. Like these emotions of depression and anxiety are coming into us all as messages from like our future self saying, if we carry on as a society down this path, we're all going to be fucked. So yeah. therefore it really <laughs> wants us to try and listen to the message and change the behavior. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's so difficult, isn't it? You know, the, the uh, I know you mentioned like porn like quite a couple of times. Mm -hmm. It's like the barrier to entry or the friction is most people's yeah. phones it's and a crazy. couple of clicks versus like go and find and like a partner is can be a lot of effort and yeah. 
you know, I mean, even granted now, I'd say it's much easier because of the dating apps and all the other stuff that it comes to. But it used to be like, oh, you just bump into someone in the pub or you have to have a, a difficult, awkward, awkward conversation with someone, you know, to start that. But yeah. again, probably a good thing in terms of everything that you're speaking about. In, in terms, terms of, of dopamine, dopamine yeah. the dopamine would rise slowly. If you meet someone in a pub, you've got to engage in a conversation, make them laugh, get them into you and like all that kind of stuff. And eventually get home, <laughs> kiss, eventually get sex. It's like this big slow curve towards pleasure. And mm. porn is like scrolling Instagram, look at those girls' tits, now I'm on Pornhub, and then it's like, boom, gone. And yeah. it's like this massive spike and crash. And the porn topic is so interesting because I, uh, I posted a video the other day on Instagram of like what happens when we watch porn versus what happens when we have sex in terms of the dopamine curves. Mm. As in the porn is spike and crash, sex is slow up and down curve. Slow up and down, that's a bit <laughs> <laughs> yeah. connected yeah. to what I'm saying. But... Uh, when you look at your engagement stats, I'm sure you do on Instagram, you look yeah. at retention rates and that sort of stuff. Mm. That video and the story I posted about it is the highest like retention thing I've ever seen. So mm. it means we are all engaging with those behaviors a lot, masturbation and porn and stuff. And it's like this unspoken thing in society where we're like, no, let's just pretend that's not happening and we're all just screw ourselves with it. Mm. But like the amount of men, particularly men, but women watch porn too, that message me saying like, I did seven days without porn and I'm suddenly way more motivated and I'm not procrastinating and I feel yeah. happier in my head. Like, we really have to draw these things connected mm -hmm. together. Yeah. We need to realize what's happening. And, and, so, and that could be the same with, I mean, this is the, because if you kind of look at the society, we uh, had a, an amazing guest on the same before, Anise, mm. uh, and she said about us living in a, like an obesogenic society. Okay. But, but it's, it's you know, it's a lot of what we're talking about yeah. here in terms of the quick fixes, the, the drive throughs which again, spiky dopamine, highly palatable, processed foods, really tasty. Yeah, then, you know, you're, you're, you're vaping, you're not walking as much. You know, just everything that society is building nowadays is to move less, eat more, more highly palatable stuff, and probably just completely abuse your dopamine levels like it, it's like society has gone too far that way and it's we are really fighting against i guess almost like our natural urges mm. to, do the, to do the opposite you know what i mean and that's the the irony and why cold water became the biggest dopamine behavior is like because everything always works with extremes on either end of a curve and we've got so much pleasure that now you've got like <laughs> millions of people put themselves in absolute hell yeah. because like our brain is instinctively trying to figure out what's the other side of this yeah. scale so everyone's freezing themselves to death because they're over pleasuring themselves yeah and that is just, and like you don't necessarily need to do things as extreme as yeah. freezing yourself to death. But like there's a load of stuff on that side of the effortful curve, mm. like as basic as make your bed every day when you wake up. That's just going to lead to like a rebalancing mm. of that seesaw. Mm. And it really is a seesaw. Like how this whole thing works is there's this lady called Anna Lemke at Stanford University who created this whole concept called the pleasure pain balance. And what we basically know about the brain is. Dopamine is created in an area of the brain called the hypothalamus, little ball in the center. It's sitting there and it's literally generating dopamine. And from an emotional standpoint, your capacity to experience pleasure, like feel joy and happy and that kind of emotion, and then pain, feel discomfort and pain within your brain, they literally sit co-located in that area and they operate on a oh. seesaw. So if, for example, you're a hunter-gatherer and literally have to wake up, survive the cold, like make a fire, build stuff, mm -hmm. hunt, it's literally a painful experience. So the seesaw tip the pain side down, pleasure would arise in the brain in order to reinforce these behaviors so we'd keep doing them. And what we've basically done in the modern world is tip that seesaw into the other direction where it's like tons and tons of pleasure. And the brain only knows to operate how it's always operated. So then it's putting all of our brains into pain effectively. And that's like what so much of this modern mm -hmm. mental health epidemic is. That's wild. Yeah. I do find as well, like if I'm ever like, like stresses, like a nine, you know, which would be like very high, I'd say for, for me or 10, almost like the harder I work out the next day, it almost like like a punishment painful like it's all it's like it's painfully hard but mm -hmm. then the, the high off the back of it is the, the release to an extent is is sort of huge off the back of that like like super super intense workouts um like just give like, like it just the, the, the contrast is massive um, yeah 100 or, or to an extent um and i've told you about this and you said i'm a i don't know, I don't know what you said so <laughs> something weird <laughs> uh, which was basically like you know sometimes i'll have my mind where i feel tired or feel this and i'm like right i'm doing split squats and i'm like oh i'm tired today i'll hey, just, I'll just yeah i'll just do the lower weight and the second i start to have like these like we in what i class is like week four yeah. i basically say right for the for basically the punishment of thinking a week of thought i'm now going to lift a heavy weight and do an extra set um which i'm just trying to like condition my mind of like do not 
do not like go down the sort of weaker path. But then again, you the more you keep doing that, when these obstacles arise, I don't know if this is even mm-hmm. dopamine or if I'm just chatting absolute shit now. No, um, that wouldn't lie. <laughs> the more likely you are yeah. to repeat the behavior. Yeah, so like when someone else comes up challenging, I'm like, oh, this is uncomfortable, but like, hey, I've been here before. Yeah, my inner um, bitch doesn't win. My inner bitch doesn't win, yeah. <laughs> and these, these things yeah. are important. And it is, it's like annoying this information to discover that like, it is up to us to solve this problem. Like mm. it is up to us to like learn to be more disciplined and have more self-control. It'd be lovely if the solution was let's just sit on the sofa and scroll our phones and eat crisps and watch porn. That'd be great. But that just isn't the answer to humans feeling mm. good again. Like it is about like really taking responsibility for your life and thinking I have to change my behavior. I have to listen yeah. to all these shit emotions, realize I don't want them for my whole life yeah. and start altering things. It doesn't have to be loads of stuff at once, but it's just like you, we have yeah. to start changing it up. So this and, is not- oh, sorry, I was going to say it's not also like boring stuff like making your bed <laughs> yeah. so I saw one of your posts which I thought was really good and it it had like a list of quick dopamine yeah. and slow dopamine yeah but what I thought was even more interesting is like the little subtitle was quick dopamine was fun yeah but slow dopamine was joy yeah and I actually think if you ask most people what do you want from your life they would probably say joy before they said fun mm-hmm. most people yeah um and so when you look at that list of things yeah it's not boring things like making your bed and doing your cleaning. Yeah. So could you give us some examples? 100%. I mean, there's a variety of things in there. Any kind of exercise, fantastic weights, cardio, all that kind of stuff. One of the things you might enjoy most would be like your personal flow state activity, which is like some kind of activity that just gets you really in the zone. It might be some kind of hobby. It might be music. It might be a sport. Anything like that would be amazing. On that, just it's really important to understand this. So many people in the modern world hear that and then think, I don't have a hobby. I don't have anything I'm interested in except scrolling my phone and doing my job. And if you don't know what your hobby is, whilst you're scrolling over the next few days, try and observe as closely as you can what video is entertaining you the most. Mm. And it's very likely your hobby lies within that because so many people love watching cooking videos or love watching sport or love watching Mm. whatever it might be. And we're like all vicariously watching others do our hobbies instead of doing them ourselves because that's now an option. So if you can learn to like engage in your own personal hobby on a regular basis, that would be insane for the dopamine. That's, that's great advice. Because uh, that is that is something that you hear repeatedly. Like, I don't have any passions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But like, again, if you pay attention to what you're paying attention to, yeah. this could be a great, um, yeah. you know, opener to like what. I also think a common one is um, what people encourage their kids to do. Mm-hmm. Mm. Is, is generally come from somewhere. You don't just randomly think, oh, you know what, Charlie, I think you'd love horse riding. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you probably <laughs> instinctively yeah. like it. And yeah. You probably think I would love to do that, but I can't because I'm too old or I'm too this. So I'll let my kids do it. And it comes back to like our brain seeks for dopamine. And if we didn't have the phone to watch other people doing it, we'd all be bored as shit sitting on the sofa. So then we would go and do the things. We'd go and sit and cook the meal or we'd play with a musical instrument or whatever it might be. But now like we have this easy option and then we're all just doing that. And we work with so many kids in schools kids ADHD rates in schools are going absolutely through the roof. A a school, for example, that I train in year eight, about three years ago, they had 8% diagnosis of ADHD. So that's like 12 year olds, 12 year olds, 8% (laughs) diagnosis. This year they had 60% ADHD diagnosis in a three year difference. And ADHD is a very, very dopamine related challenge. It's caused by low dopamine levels. So it's something that we could develop genetically, but now we're developing behaviorally as a result of our lifestyle. I was about to say, like, is it a, is it genetic or is it like, is it like nature versus nature in that sort of sense? You could be it born c- with a brain both. that produces slightly less dopamine, 100%. Yeah. Like for hundreds of years, thousands of years, that might have been the case. But nowadays you can really completely just break the system. So then you start, like if you're low in dopamine, you procrastinate, you get like overexcited and Mm. then you crash and you can't focus on anything. And like, so we're all developing what we all, we we originally identified as ADHD. Are you ready to lose 30 to 60 pounds in under six months without restrictive diets, countless hours exercising or any guesswork? Well, we help women over 30 do exactly that. Lose weight guaranteed and Five to 10 pounds a month is the average weight loss. And that's not a cherry pick statistic. That is the average. Your weight loss results are 100% guaranteed. You will lose unwanted body fat. So apply at bodysmartfitness.com. That's bodysmartfitness.com. But only if you're a woman over 30 and want to lose 30 to 60 pounds. It's, it's, not, it's not surprising though, isn't it? Like if you think about a kid now, phone, YouTube, video games, possibly like some really young kids are vaping. And it's just like, all that is like so stimulating. I mean, it's like- Sugary foods, yeah. Sit in the classroom, sit in the classroom for eight hours. 
and read a book and speak to the teacher. I know. It's like this is the most boring <laughs> thing in the world. So boring. And school, yeah. is, unfortunately, isn't innovating either. Like yeah. the reason our live events can do so good in school is because we come in with all this like really visually exciting stuff for them to engage with. And they're all like, holy shit, this is like more like TikTok. It's not like TikTok, it's yeah. effort. Yeah. But it's more like that than these like slides with just like mm. white and black like writing and stuff. And with that hobby thing, kids really have to engage with the hobby. Like they can't, like we saw a kid in the school the other day that had an average daily screen time of 19 hours, 54 minutes a day, every day. And I scroll back like weeks like this, every day, 19 hours, 54. So that means they're only sleeping hours, for five hours. hours. Sleeping for five and like the rest of the time they're just not, not on their phone. So oh like under gosh. their desk, whatever it might be at school, mm. all the time. And like, for the dopamine system, that's like being 10 years old and like having a shot of vodka every 10 minutes the whole day. Like it's no different. Or worse, the, like on drugs, right? Yeah, it's yeah. no different for the brain. Like if you if you get someone scrolling TikTok in, M in an fMRI scanner, like a brain scanner, or they're taking drugs, drinking, like it's all the same. Like everything mm -hmm. is the same in terms of dopamine spikes and crashes. And kids really, really need a hobby to engage with. And their hobby lies within the favorite thing they're watching on their phone. That is where it's at. And like finding that as a parent is so valuable to the kid because the only way a kid is going to be willing to sacrifice time on the iPad, time on the phone, is if the other thing is really stimulating. Because if you just say, put your phone down and sit on the sofa, mm -hmm. they'll go through this huge dopamine crash and get super pissed off and experience effectively what adults would know as like drug withdrawal. But that's basically what a kid will experience. So if the phone's going down, the only kids we've seen willing to put the phone down are then like wanting to get better at a musical instrument or go into their football practice mm -hmm. or whatever it might be because they need something else that's going to stimulate that system that's getting hit by the phone. Mm -hmm. It's really, really key. It's, it's wild, isn't it? It's like, that's got to be such a, you know, if you were doing 19 hours a day on your phone and getting that little sleep, like how, how does that impact like the development of the brain? And also like, that's like, I'd say we all are all addicted to our phones. Same, and the, 100%. And the best way I could describe this is like, if, have you ever seen someone where, or have you ever had it where you realize you don't know where your phone is? So you can, like, you sat here and you're like, where's my phone? And when you're like, you check your pockets yeah. and you're like, where Panic. is it? I mean, I mean, say you're in like a conversation, it's like you're out of the room now. Like you can't even think of the people that you're speaking about because mm. you're like, where's my phone? It's like, that's like, Addiction. yeah you're just like where's my yeah, next is. shot coming from you know what i mean you're just like i need to go and find my phone now <laughs> and, and, I, and I, you I, watch people panic yeah literally. you hear like i've lost my george and my girlfriend did it in the coffee shop this morning she, she, i suddenly see her eyes just enter such deep panic and yeah. i'm thinking fuck what's happened <laughs> and it's like where's my phone and it's yeah. like it's in your pocket it's okay but it's like that's our brain like fearing not having the dopamine hit that's causing the panic mm. effectively. Right. Like if you said to an alcoholic, like no alcohol in your house for a week, they would mm. immediately panic, get angry, feel like annoyed. And like there's exactly the same. Because kids, I, and I've seen this and I've, I've, I've seen it a lot actually, when you take an iPad mm. or a phone off a kid, the mm. tantrum it's insane. is like, people have never even seen the kids act like that sometimes, yeah. you know, and it's just like, it's an explosion. But kids and never had drugs before. Like we never gave like cocaine to a kid at five years old, but now that is what we're doing yeah. with TikTok. And like, it's really hard to like accept that as a society. And even is what's kids, happening. Kids TV programs mm -hmm. are made with like those quick changing scenes. Yeah, and super bright and like, like colorful music. and sound. And yeah, um, I'm really strict with screen time with Mike. My son's only two. Um, and actually he's now allowed to watch I let him watch. There's these channels on YouTube where it's like people playing in real time with other to like with toys. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you, you can watch that. Um, if or it's like, slow. Yeah, yeah, it's just literally like a hand driving a truck across to like a little jingle song. Um, or, you know, like there's a teacher who like teaches them how to say words or something. Mm -hmm. But you watch some of the stuff that is created for kids and it's it wild. is just like bam, 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 bam. And it's no wonder that they don't want to stop it because their brain is just like, constantly getting stimulated for sure and that's why when you take it off them they're so frustrated like if you were friday evening you're drinking your glass of wine you're like oh this is so nice have this moment of peace and then like someone literally pulled the glass of wine out your hand and said <laughs> no you'd literally be like give it back yeah. <laughs> you'd get angry at yeah. them and like the kid is like they're there on the ipad just that's in a great analogy deep yeah. state of presence watching the ipad like oh this is fucking amazing I'm just getting loads of dopamine they don't know that but that is what's happening and then boom it's out of their hand and they're like no way <laughs> like i need i need that <laughs> dopamine hit back yeah and it's really like what, what you're doing with your son or daughter there yeah. is uh, super smart because it's all about 
pace of the dopamine spike in the brain. Like I completely appreciate kids are gonna engage with technology with some way now. Like amazing if you can somehow raise a kid without technology, obviously that is optimum. But at the same time, like I understand it's hard, you're gonna want moments of peace and all that kind of stuff. And it's just what they're watching, how much effort is their brain having to engage in order to get pleasure from it. So like if they're watching a video, is it that super stimulating, like immediate pleasure within 10 seconds? Or are they having to sit and concentrate for five minutes before they even fully understand the storyline? Yeah. And that is what then is going to lead to a more blunted dopamine spike. Or if so they were would you gaming, say then like the games, because mm. you get like little games, you can like drag a shape onto the matching shape or something. Yeah. That's better than watching because they have to think and do something. Yes, yeah, so, and then gaming is super interesting as well because gaming's massive in kids, it's growing like crazy as well. And again, it's like effort in the brain, how much is engaged. And if you take a game like Candy Crush, Candy Crush is like the biggest like fast pleasure dopamine game there is in the world. And it's so easy that like, I don't know if you've played Candy Crush, but it basically draws the line for you and you're like, a, <laughs> yes. you're like a toddler, like, oh yeah, fill in the gap. And like the, the, <laughs> even that bit of trying to figure out where to place the thing in Candy Crush, they tell you where to place it so that you don't have to engage any efforts. Just keep the dopamine flying. Mm -hmm. And that would be like the extreme end of what you're not wanting. And then the other extreme end would be like some deep strategy game where they're having to really think and it takes 20 minutes to complete a level and they're mm. having to really go through a process of effort in order to experience the joy. And if they're regularly going through a strategy game, like there's arguments that that can be of value to their brain. Like it can train their attention span, it can make them disciplined and determined and stuff like that. But it's very important that they never have the other one in, right. in order to... Because uh, it's really interesting because you used to game a lot, didn't you? Uh, yeah, me and too, my me husband too. did, yeah. did as well yeah. and he's like you know what if you don't give him any technology you don't give him this he's going to not have a bunch of skills that other kids are going to have so mm -hmm. we're going to be doing him a disservice so there's this constant like yeah. line and there, that is a fair argument like I, I don't go in schools and say that all kids should stop gaming yeah. at all but it's like it's the choice it's of the, the game the game they're playing then it's also like if you've been like locked in on a game for like 45 to 60 minutes your brain definitely needs coming back to that attention thing when I was explaining broad and narrow attention our brain doesn't want to be in narrow attention for absolutely ages. And gaming is so intelligently designed to create this like superficial like flow state experience so we can stay in there for hours and hours. And if you've done 60 minutes on it, the attention needs to go broad again. So it needs to like go downstairs and like talk to someone and make some food or a drink or something. So the attention can rest itself, mm -hmm. recharge, and then like you could go back in, something like that. But there's ways in which you could game in the healthiest way possible effectively. Mm -hmm. I mean, I used to like play World of Warcraft for like 10 hours or more. <laughs> yeah. like, I, but I actually, in in retrospect, actually learned a lot of skills, probably learned switch type of playing mm -hmm. on, a, on a computer from like a young age. Uh, I used to like buy and sell on the auction house. So I learned some like trading skills. Like looking back, <laughs> it seems ridiculous, but it's, no, say, no, it's true, literally yeah. the same principles. And yeah. the game, we, we actually, me and Ty went and played it again like a couple of years ago. And uh, it's just funny for what you said. So when that first came out, it was actually really difficult to like do some of the tasks, the requests mm. that were set out because there was no guidance. It was like, you got it. And he was just like, read this. It didn't even make sense to just like figure it out. And it could take hours. And now when you go on, there's basically like a map, isn't it, to tell you where to go and do everything. So it's so much easier. So even from like, I guess, well, what's the saying here in terms of dopamine, um, the, the more friction that was in the game, almost like the better it was. The better it was for Just your brain. for 10 hours. Yeah, yeah, 10 hours might be a little bit too much time <laughs> yeah. without sunlight and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. But yeah. The, uh, the game companies know this. Like Even yeah. things like Fortnite and Call of Duty went through a huge shift where they moved to this thing called skill-based matchmaking, where mm. you play with people that are the same standard as you. And they, they effectively, for everyone that's really good at the game, it actually becomes really, really difficult, but mm. those people are already hooked. But for everyone that's crap at the game that have never played before, they all play against other people that are shite, so it's mm. much easier. So then they get more hooked faster, yeah. effectively. And all of they know what they're doing. Like mm. they, the option, obviously, the goal mm. is just max time on, whether it's yeah. phone or game console, whatever it may be. Um, but you can make smart decisions, yeah. for sure. Just coming back to um, the school thing and with the kids and stuff, yeah, because that's obviously a massive shift. When you say it was like eight percent and now sixty, yeah. So ADHD um, huge has been huge in the states. Now it's becoming like huge over here as yeah. well. Uh, medication gets brought up a lot mm -hmm. um, in terms of people taking uh, Adderall, Adderall or Ritalin, Ritalin. Yeah. Um, and that type of stuff. Uh, I actually went and I tried, I tried, tried to be very open. I went counselling about two years ago. I've done it for like a year. About a couple of months in, the counsellor was like, "Hey, I think." Uh, you might have a bit of ADHD, so we're going to explore that next time. Um, and then I come back, I was like, what do you think I would have done if I had ADHD? She's like, you probably went down the rabbit hole pretty hard. And I was like, yeah. And she's like, what do you think? And I was like, probably. Mm -hmm. and, um, but I, and, and I was like, do I do the test or whatever else? She was like, I don't think you need to. I think you can just learn some strategies to keep on top of it. Yeah. Spoke about medication. I was very 
against it because I'm very aware of my own. Like I could see that become on a crutch fast. Like I've done it with a uh, pre-workout formulas. So I used to take a pre-workout for the gym and then I got to like, I need it to the point where if I didn't take it, I'd feel like my workout was going to be worse psychologically, probably, you know, dopamine is expecting me to have it. I don't have it. Yeah. Um, and then like, I just removed as many of these crutches as I, as I could out my life. Yeah. So that when, when things do happen, it's easier to weather. So when something like that was presented, I was just like, no. And then also I didn't go and get an official diagnosis. So it's just what a counselor has said. And since speaking to many other people around me, they've gone, you probably do as well. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't see it as a bad thing. I can, I can see it as like a, a superpower, but mm -hmm. the, the, I am now just watching this like wave of people like self-diagnose saying they've got ADHD and seeing the hearing these uh, stats in, in kids. And then people are getting going on like medication. I'm like, God, if I was in school now, I was the kid who's like couldn't stop and couldn't stop fidgeting and was mm. being distracted. But like if someone put me on like amphetamines at like six years old, that's like terrifying to me. Mm. That, and it that, could have dumbed you down. You might not be sitting there yeah. doing this job and yeah. thriving so much if you had taken it. Yeah. So what like what's your opinion on what's happening in terms of like the overdiagnosis? Yeah. So if it's an overdiagnosis. Uh, amphetamines, drugs. I know it's like a touchy subject to be honest, but like it's it it interests me because it it worries me a lot to be honest as well. Hundred percent. So first of all, key distinction is genetic ADHD versus behavioral ADHD. Mm -hmm. And some people can be born with low dopamine production in their brain, and then it can make you much more prone to so all the addictive behaviors. It makes focus much harder. It makes you more impulsive. It makes you more fidgety in class. So maybe you do genetically mm -hmm. have ADHD. I'd imagine given how successful you've become, like it is very likely that you do have some ADHD mm -hmm. components within your brain. And medication obviously is a complicated subject. And if it suddenly goes really well and that's like a great plan, then that's cool. But I think definitely the first point of call is like really looking behaviorally down how a kid is living their life and then assessing whether it could be treated mm -hmm. in a natural way because like why not at least explore that first. And there is this concept like ADHD is a superpower. Like how, how does that kind of thing work? it's really important to understand like why actually it is such a value to your brain and how different it would have been for hunter gatherers that had ADHD. Mm -hmm. And say, for example, you took a hunter gatherer and they're genetically born with ADHD. They might not have been necessarily discussing that. Like, I think you've got low dopamine levels, mate, but <laughs> they, some of them would have just naturally lower dopamine production. Okay. And that hunter gatherer gets to 10 years old or so, like grows up, it's a kid and it starts like having to like significantly contribute to the group. So it has to say, go out and hunt or it has to build shelter or whatever it might be. As soon as that hunter-gatherer goes out there and starts hunting or building shelter, the huge dopamine increase it's going to experience compared to the average person because mm. they're starting from a lower baseline. So the difference of dopamine is going to be higher than someone starting at like an equal level. They're going to think, holy shit, like this felt amazing, this hunting in this building. And therefore, they're going to get a bigger reward off it. So they're going to seek for more of it. They're going to think, wow, this was awesome. So all the ADHD hunter-gatherers would have become the most advanced and most valuable people to that group because they would have got the biggest hits. So they would have got the best at everything effectively. And it's very difficult in our modern world because with ADHD in the modern world, you're trying to be at school. And Sorry, so just, just to go back to that, that basically, what, what you're basically saying is people who have ADHD in, in that time, effort was the most rewarding to them. So they mm. would chase effort the most because they would get the high, higher rewards than other people. Because there was no quick pleasure. There was nothing right. you could do that was quick pleasure in yeah. that hunter-gatherer world. Maybe like if they found like fermented fruit or something it could give you, but that wouldn't be something they were like reliably making mm -hmm. in order to do so. And I'm sure if they found fermented fruit, the ADHD ones would have absolutely nailed the fermented fruit <laughs> because, it, yeah. because they would have loved the, uh, yeah. the dopamine hit yeah. from it. And yeah, effectively, that is how it works. Mm. They would have become the greatest contributors to that group. And I really think, and like we're working on this as a, a new book concept of reframing this whole idea from attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, to ADHA being attention deficit hyperactivity ability. Mm. And if you can identify what the thing is, and it doesn't have to be like you have an eight-year-old kid and you have to identify what their career is. It's just what are they good at right now? Like mm. it doesn't have to be, or oh, what is their plan long-term? It's just like, is there something they're good at now? Like maybe they really like archery or they like dancing or they like singing or golf or tennis or whatever it might be. And you need to absolutely maximize their engagement with that behavior. Mm. So they start naturally getting that dopamine because an ADHD kid is going to be so vulnerable to porn and gaming and sugar because like now that is an option to get the dopamine hits yeah. from that. Mm. In terms of the diagnosis question, when you take an ADHD assessment test, you're really assessing someone's attention span and their likelihood for impulsive behavior and all of these kind of metrics. And 
just before someone goes for their ADHD test on a Tuesday morning at 10 a.m., the night before, they probably watch porn, scroll their phone, <laughs> and ate a sugary dinner and pudding. So, like, they're going in with really low dopamine. So the mm. chance of getting a positive diagnosis is so high because you're exhi exhibiting mm. the symptoms that someone would have in 1940 from actually genetic low right. dopamine. So, like, it is very likely you'll get diagnosed with ADHD. And... I really believe like 2030s, it'd be very hard to find a single human on earth that wouldn't necessarily pass an ADHD diagnosis mm. because we're just going to continue to smash this dopamine system. And those that have like lived quite disciplined lifestyles with a lot of effortful action might not pass the test and those that have got super hooked on all the addictive stuff. And it's really important to understand this doesn't like demean ADHD. Like ADHD is a genuine real difficulty. It's very hard when you're procrastinating and you can't take action, you feel low and all that kind of stuff. But it's really important that the diagnosis doesn't just lead to you then thinking, oh, well, I've got ADHD. So like, yeah. I can't do what everyone else can do. It's really important to think like, now I've got this understanding that genetically or behaviorally, I'm low in dopamine. Mm -hmm. And now I need to start really thinking like, what am I over engaging with that's addictive? And can I like slightly reduce that behavior down? And what is something that could really build my dopamine levels? Like of all these different actions we talk about, like what is the thing that you could mm -hmm. think, I could get into that hobby or I could concentrate more on work or cold water or discipline or working out. Yeah. What's something that could raise it naturally? Mm -hmm. That's because that's, we see this in, like everyone looks for like a label. And I think labels are very dangerous. You know, mm. if it's ADHD or, you know, in, in, in the health space, it can be like, oh, I've got PCOS or I've got a thyroid issue or I'm going through menopause. It's like, give me the label to justify. Yeah, poor to, behavior. Yeah, to an extent. And people hate that. Like, yeah. how dare Jamie say that? You know what I mean? Mm. You know what I mean? Like, you, you, you don't get what I'm going through. And it's yeah. like, no, that's not the case. But I think just coming back to what you were saying a little bit earlier, it's like, one of my favorite sayings is like, not necessarily your fault, but it was your responsibility. It's like, like yes, you mm. may have, uh, you know, some issues of ADHD, or yes, you may have polycystic ovaries. You may be going through menopause, you know, comma, like, and what are you going to do about it? You know what I mean? Mm. It's like, you're just going to let this be the thing that allows you to not live the life that you want. Mm. Or are you going to look for patterns of success that other people have had who are going through menopause, who've got ADHD or, or You can actually use it as like a helpful channeling tool. So instead of trying all of the hundred million things out there that might help, you can be like, oh, for people with a dopamine struggle, these things are shown to help. So I'll focus my energy on trying those things rather than trying all of the things. Mm. Yeah. So it can actually be really helpful to have a label if you see it in the right way. It can. Yeah. And, and it is just how we engage with that like diagnosis in our head. Like I am very fearful of a mass diagnosis of kids with ADHD and putting all kids on medication. Like, that yeah. doesn't sound like a beautiful path for humanity to no. go down. Mm. And then it makes me think, oh, I wish we didn't have any of this ADHD testing and I wish we didn't even know. But then also in the process of discovering this whole ADHD thing, if we can come to a point where we start realizing all of these kids that are more ADHD actually needed to, need to like educate themselves in a little bit of a different way and like find their thing a little bit earlier in life that they can engage with regularly, then the fact we figured out this mass diagnosis thing could be a value. Yeah. But and many like, schools go, oh, maybe we'll put music back on the curriculum and we'll do more sports. And, and art and creative yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Because that is interesting how it's correlated with all that stuff being less funded, less popular, like taken off the curriculum. Um, yeah, and at like the same my, time. My, uh, a lady in my team called Jen, she's awesome. She's like operations at our company. And she has a son who's struggling with ADHD and he, he likely genetically has ADHD. He's always exhibited this like high energy, high excitement crash, like poor, like attention span, that kind of stuff. And school is there really like, it's really stressful for her because they're saying like, he's not up to this standard in this class and yeah. da, da, da. school is like very metric based. And I've been really working on this with her. Like, what well, can we try and find something that he likes to engage with? Can we try? And, and we've like experimented with a lot of stuff over the last year and she's super motivated. She's a good mom. And, Recently, he's just started like a, a martial arts thing and he started doing this martial arts course after school. And it is being like so transformational for this Love kid. That. He has yeah. this activity that like he feels like he's good at, he's making progress at. So suddenly he's building confidence because school is telling him he's an idiot, which is killing his confidence, which is just like a whole nother world. But it suddenly has a thing and it's flow state that martial arts is building mm -hmm. his dopamine. And then what he's going to ultimately discover once he's done this for like six months or so is that's naturally raising his dopamine in the evenings. Then he's going to get to school and all that shit that he has to do at school because it's part of being a kid, like he's going to be more doable mm -hmm. than if you're like spending all evening scrolling a quick yeah. pleasure on an iPad. Yeah. It's a completely different scenario. So the identification of that habit is very, very important. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you literally 
sound like you were like talking about my childhood then. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, just like I just had all those issues in school. I like, couldn't got, like struggle to concentrate with like copying other people's tests. Mm-hmm. Um, just struggled, maybe a little bit socially awkward, struggled with other kids, uh, but excelled in sports. And then mm-hmm. like just then was like captain of like multiple teams and was in every, like every, like, and that's where I would always excel. So it was like struggling with a lot, a lot of grades, but just excelling in sports. Um, and like that, I think I think definitely made it more manageable is basically the best way I could say. I couldn't think of anything worse now of just going home and the social media that and the, there, was it? yeah, well, we could start to get MSN. Like, oh, yeah. MSN was everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's the thing. Like, MSN yeah. was everything. You had to get someone's email address, and then you had to like sit there <laughs> and like try and time. engage with them. Yeah. And them. Whereas now it's like just like Snapchat. It's so, it's, so, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's very passive. Yeah. Yeah. MSN was fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I liked it. Yeah. Oh, we have we've like only done one of the four. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, I mean, like, means a big I did yeah. say I think we could talk for hours and I don't think I was wrong um but shall we talk about oxytocin a little bit as well yeah 100 percent. yeah um so you mentioned earlier that this is not <clears throat> one of the ones that you can kind of get a quick fix on oxytocin mm-hmm. so what is this one for this is all about bonding humanity together it releases most predominantly in the human brain in the moment a mum gives birth the moment the mum and the baby like the baby enters the world there's this huge oxytocin surge in both their brains and it creates the initial like maternal pair bond and then as you go through those first few months of breastfeeding and physical touch and all that kind of stuff builds and builds in the baby's brain and creates this desire for human connection you then build relationships family friends romantic relationships as you go through life and it's just like driving human connection and it's something that as a result of our very dopamine lifestyles is getting lower and lower like you take the average scenario of Mm. a couple sitting on the sofa in the evening they've got back from work they're shattered and now it's like put netflix on sit either end of the sofa both have our phones in our hand and just like smash our brain with dopamine whereas if that couple even if they were watching tv but at least sat next to each other and had their hand on their leg and some physical touch and something like that then they're getting oxytocin so it's like because of our dopamine seeking behavior, we're now really losing this human mo- connection. Molecule. Yeah, definitely. And is that the same reason why, have you heard of the six second kiss? Yeah, that would be very that oxytocin, oxytocin related. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's, I have not heard of this. Oh, so it's one of our rules in our household. Okay. Oh, yeah. okay. You have to kiss for six seconds every day. There you go. That yeah. would be powerful. Yeah. yeah kissing and for then sometimes we're like, oh my God, it's been three days and we haven't, because like with a toddler, you're like, we literally haven't had six seconds. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Um, but then you really notice if you go like a week, mm. you you are just shitty with each other. And mm-hmm. Like you feel really distant. And obviously it's not just the one kiss every yeah. day. But like yeah. if your lives have been so distracted and busy that you couldn't even find six seconds, it's also like part of that making time for each other. And this is going to be like sex as well with your partner as well. It's going to mm-hmm. be like another. Huge part yeah, of it. Yeah. I even had a. Physical touch in terms of hugs is also really, really powerful yeah. for stimulating this hormone. And I was in this training a number of months back and there was this man who was kind of reluctant to the fact his company had put him on mental health training. He was in his 50s and he's thinking, mm. oh, what's all that like weak stuff about? Which is fair. Like that was a perspective of mental health. And this whole dose thing shares like mm. a different idea of it. When I got to this physical touch thing, we have this touch like card in our gamification. Mm. You have to rate how many hugs you're averaging per day and you have to have a think about it. And like, whilst you're listening, you could try and give yourself a number. It might be five, it might be one, it might be zero, 10. And the average number I see across most groups, when you get like a thousand people to vote, it will say like 1.5 hugs on average per day that society mm. will be getting. And this man, when he came to talk to me at the end, was like, I actually just realized in that question that I never hugged my wife. Aww. And that's like sad to hear and also something super common now like you rush off for work in the morning it's like see ya and you just Mm. walk out the door come back from work and it's like how quickly can i get that beer out the fridge and sit on the phone (laughs) on my phone and i just said to him like for the next week just make sure every single day you leave you hug her for like five seconds come back hug her for five seconds all you got to do from the Mm. whole training just pick that and he came back in the next week very very happy with a smile on his face and it hadn't just like really helped their connection. It actually reignited a part of their life that hadn't been there apparently for about eight years. And even things like how likely you are to have sex with your partner is going to be so connected to even whether you're hugging them when you leave for work. Mm -hmm. Like in order to desire sex with someone, you need a load of oxytocin within your brain. Like our brain is so designed to like try and have sex, even though the modern world is screwing this, try and have sex (laughs) with people we feel a deep connection with. Mm. And when we feel a deep connection, oxytocin rises in the brain and then it's like, oh, now I kind of want to kiss this person and sleep with them and cuddle them and stuff like that. And 
if you're never creating oxytocin in the relationship and then your brain's like, oh no, we should have sex because like that's part of being a human. Then you go from no oxytocin to like, right, let's have sex tonight. And then it's like just not a very nice experience mm. for you. Yeah. But consistent small doses like the six second kiss, hugs, sitting close to each other on the sofa, all these things then like layer the oxytocin. So then sexual experiences are going to be much better. Yeah. And is it is it 20 second hug? Is that the thing? 20 second would be amazing. If you didn't have to, like a five second hug would 100% release oxytocin. Yeah. If you can like lie there and like really cuddle each other, then that's like amazing. Yeah. It's just going to release more and more with every second that you're that's, cuddling. That's the like just constantly wants hugs. Oh, like, yeah, she, It's just like, I can't, and, and then like sometimes if I can tell she's feeling really well, she's like, can we have a lie down hug? Yeah. <laughs> it's just, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's like. A, I actually call it a recharge. A recharge. Like, come here, I need a recharge. I, need a recharge. I literally just like oxytocin is very, uh, yeah. <laughs> very healing for the body. And like, say mm. for example, Steph was like struggling, like a stressful day at work or whatever it might be in yeah. her mind. Like oxytocin is going to be so healing. Mm. I even had this. I've had this crazy experience. I have this this girlfriend here with me, Georgia, and me and Georgia haven't seen each other for two months. She lives in Sydney, and we met on Instagram. And I went to Australia to go and meet her there about five months ago or something like that, mm -hmm. and. When I was there, I got like very little sleep and I uh, <laughs> not <laughs> Yeah, I bet you did. <laughs> Just because the jet lag yeah, yeah, yeah. was screwed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I, I have this yeah. <laughs> like, so that was actually designed to be that yeah. way. <laughs> have this yeah. thing on my wrist and we measuring yeah. my HRV. Mm -hmm. And HRV is this good measure of how calm your body is. It's measuring mm -hmm. how consistently your heart is beating. If the number is high, you're physically fit, but also your body is very calm. And if it's low, it's the opposite is occurring. Despite low sleep, and I've been wearing this thing for years, so I know how the data works. Despite no sleep, my HRVs every day were really, really high. Mm. And it's very likely because we were cuddling every evening and just cuddling. Yeah. And <laughs> the HRV yeah. then rose. And interestingly, yeah. it's been two months, you just come. The last three days, the HRV has suddenly been so high. And again, I've had three days of traveling lots, only like five yeah. hours sleep a night. Yeah. My HRV score, this measure of how calm mm. and like healed my body is, has jumped like 10 points. Yeah. For sure, and yeah. it's just physical yeah. touch. It's like yeah. having a massive impact. So is that, because I don't know if this is a, a real thing, maybe Simon can pull this up, which they said, um, you know, like loneliness is like worse than smoking killer. or mm, like yeah. one of the biggest killers in, in, the, like in the country at the moment. Yeah. Uh, just loneliness and... You like, said your blood pressure is lower when you spend more time with staff as well, haven't you? Yeah, like literally, like I am. Um, that was one of the things that I noticed is like, yeah, when I spend more time with staff, like my blood pressure is typically lower uh, just because it's been something I've been like monitoring for yeah. quite Fair some way. time right now, which is like by, by like my systolic is by like 10 or 15 points. You know what yeah. I mean? And I, I think it's, there's probably a bunch of things. I set more boundaries when I'm with her than when, like when she goes away, I'll just plow the work where yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um so you know there's the sad that side of things as well but yeah it's um is is that like a huge part of it then like why loneliness is becoming such an issue because that's obviously if it's becoming a big killer then it's um it's so significant i mean it might be this this study might there's this one that basically shows that a uh, loneliness is equivalent to smoking 50 yeah 15 cigarettes a day sorry I don't yeah the world yeah, health yeah. organization have said that it's as bad as smoking 15 yeah. cigarettes a day and like humans are very designed to not be on their own. Yeah. Like if you look at the animal kingdom, some animals are great on their own. A polar bear, for example, smashes it on its own. Humans in the wild like so deeply have to be with each other. Like we would never have evolved as far as we did. Like a human physically compared to like a tiger, obviously is not, no match. But as a group and we're smart, like we can survive anything basically. And when you look at something like your blood pressure reducing or this HRV measure mm -hmm. going up, we know that like, we think of love as like a heart. Like when we think of the word love, we draw a heart and our heart is very connected to this emotion of love. And I think humans haven't even necessarily fully figured out how connected mm. the heart is to love, but we know it's connected to oxytocin and something like blood pressure or my heart rate. These mm. are the two things we've identified as changing when we're with yeah, the girl that we love. And yeah, it's yeah. like the heart, as soon as it's feeling a deep connection, is just calming itself down. And if we're all like lonely and we're not connecting in the evenings with our partners and we're really distracted and we're not bonding as much with the kid because they need to be on an iPad so I can have my glass of wine, like it's leading to this oxytocin chemical being so low yeah. and oxytocin needs to be in our brain and body. Arguably, it's more important than any of the other four because like procreation's biggest thing like for humans effectively. And whilst we're all seeking for dopamine so much now, if you compare the feeling of getting really drunk or falling in love with someone like although getting really drunk is really really fun like falling in love is nothing comparable to falling in love mm. or the feeling of like having a kid or whatever it might be 
that emotion is the most desirable for humans. And we're so chasing mm. dopamine and not oxy anymore. Mm. And if you chase oxy through human connection and contribution and touch and like really good social connection, like that is going to lead to a much more fulfilling life. Yeah, and I think you touched on some other elements with there, not just touch, because I think mm -hmm. it's really important to recognize not everybody is in a relationship or has kids. Yeah. So what are the other ways that we can stimulate oxytocin? On that, just before we go past that, pets also count for the I have touch. written down dogs. Yeah. So dogs, do, dogs and cats, like <laughs> they also do count if like you don't kind of have a partner or kids or something like yeah. that. Then you have like some fundamental behaviors that will release it. Any way in which you contribute to someone else's life, you'll notice it makes you feel good. There's even an episode in uh, Friends, the TV show, where uh, I need to get the characters right. Joey says to Phoebe that there's no such thing as a selfless good deed in this episode of Friends. And Phoebe then goes about trying to do nice things for other people and not feel good herself and ultimately concludes it's not possible. And that's because anytime you do something for someone else, you spend some time listening, you get someone some flowers, you help pick up someone's kids from school, like a conscious focus on contributing to others is going to build oxytocin. The other reason that's so powerful is this, like how much of a contribution am I making to others is in our modern world, we're getting so focused on our own experience of life, partly because of social media with our social media profiles and mirrors. And we're like really assessing ourselves. prior to humans like inventing this modern world. The whole focus was on the group and it meant your head was focused on other people and not your own problems. Mm. So therefore, like got a really gets like a lot of our anxieties and like worries away if we're thinking about others. So contribution, touch, any kind of social engagement and things like eye contact and active listening and paying attention is really key. And then the other big one is uh, gratitude. Any time in which you're like really deeply feeling the emotion of gratitude, it leads to this big boost. Okay, so like literally a basic gratitude practice could help. Yeah, like if for example right now, if you're listening and if you close your eyes for like five seconds and think of someone you're really, really grateful for in your mind and you're like, oh yeah, my mom, my dad, my cousin. And then think of something you would say to them to show how grateful you are to them. So if you think like, what is it that they're adding to your life? Why are you grateful for that human? Maybe your partner's been helping you loads with the kids. Think of what you would actually say to them. And then now if you actually send that as a message to them on iMessage, that would lead to this big rise of oxytocin in you. The person that reads the message and feels a level of appreciation for the effort they put into you, helping you in your life, they get this big rise as they read it. And that as a consistent basis, like we get lots of parents around the dinner table with their kids to just like get the kid to think like what's something that was like making me happy at school today maybe a particular lesson sport like fun thing they did with their friend but the brain like really needs that emotion of like wow i'm actually quite lucky because now we're in this like envy jealousy comparison world where we all don't think we have much yeah but compared to hunter gatherers we've got a fair bit <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the more you immerse yourself in those grateful thoughts the better yeah definitely and it's one of those things where attention goes your energy flows right so the more you focus on the good stuff the more you do the good stuff the more mm. you have good stuff to think about it, it just like self-populates and that's like the whole manifestation world and whilst that's com complicated from a scientific perspective there's a reason manifestation is such a big word in the world like mm. people obviously the more you like really focus on the good the more good seems to be attracted mm. into your life for sure and there's one more element of this which i thought was really interesting um i heard you talking on a podcast briefly about it was your relationship with yourself mm. how does that play into this yeah this is massive because we don't just release oxytocin when we're giving love to somebody else. If we give love to ourselves, it also is going to release oxytocin. And whereby we can be quite good at, say, like, saying well done to someone, like your partner, like, well done at work or well done with this, like, whatever it might be. We can be so crap at that ourselves. And any time in which you do, like, kind of celebrate your own personal progress, you're going to release oxytocin. And I really discovered this. When I said I did those quiet walks, and I do this on a consistent basis without the phone, I did that because I thought that would be one of the like worst things for me to do. And I thought, well, the fact that I can't go on a walk without my phone is crazy. So I was like, I have to just see if I can get over it. And what would happen is I'd go out there and I'd hear all this noise in my head about where I was falling short in life and the problems I was having. And it was just such a like negative experience in my thought process. Gradually, over like a few months period, I started thinking, like, how do I start just like celebrating some of my progress just so I can just stop being such a prick to myself in my head, mm -hmm. basically. Like, well, I'm putting effort into my life and yet I'm constantly telling myself off. Mm -hmm. And the fascinating thing you discover is when you actually do that, you celebrate your own progress. Not only is the voice in your head just a little bit nicer, like a bit more friendly to you and a bit kinder and you get this more oxytocin, you actually start making way more progress. And there's a really specific reason that happens. Like if you had two women, they were like 30 years old and they were like, I'm going to try and eat really healthily. That's my goal is to eat healthily. And you guys will be very familiar with this. 
if they both ate great Monday to Friday, like really healthy, natural whole foods, and then Saturday woke up and they like in the afternoon, massive Domino's, Ben and Jerry's, something like that. So they both ate all the same food. And if on that Saturday, one of them eats it and goes, oh, like, fuck's sake, I'm so bad at dieting. I'm fat. This is awful. I always do this. And the other one who's eating the same thing goes, this is annoying that I've eaten the Domino's and Ben and Jerry's, but I have just actually managed five days of healthy eating, which is a big step for me because I've never done five days of healthy eating. If you look at the progress of the two people, one of them reinforces all the crap food and the brain just hears Ben and Jerry's Domino's, I'm fat, I'm fat. And the other one hears like healthy food, healthy food, I've made progress, I've made progress. And over time that layers and you actually start getting closer to the goals you're mm -hmm. chasing anyway. So a little daily process. And I always think in a, on a morning walk, if you just say like, what is one thing I achieved yesterday? And it really doesn't have to be big things. Like it can be, I ate a healthy lunch or I made my bed or I had a cold shower or I listened better when my partner was talking to me or we cuddled last night and we didn't go on our phones in bed. Anything that would be progress. If your brain hears it, just like if you're training a dog, you say good job when it sits down, like the brain works the same. Like if it hears good job, it repeats the behavior, mm -hmm. which is super key. I love that. So you can actually give yourself an oxytocin hit by being nice to yourself. Yeah. And maybe in this moment, like think like, oh, what is something good I've done in the last week? And yeah. say to yourself, like, good job. And it can be unusual at first, like, because we've not done it. And it's like, wait, am I allowed to be nice to myself? I thought like mm -hmm. being really critical is what got me to like where I am. But whilst like critique for, yeah, to be fair, I am drinking a bottle of wine every night. That's useful to be honest with yourself about only critique is only going to kill your confidence, kill your self-belief and just like make your experience in your head horrible. Whereas starting to be like, nice, I, I am doing good things. I am doing good things only makes them more likely to happen more. Yeah, I think that's a really important distinction because a lot of people, as you say, particularly people who have gone well in their careers or whatever it is that they focus their energy on, a lot of it is driven from like, I need to do better. I need to do better. And that comes from a place of what I've done isn't really good enough. Mm. Whereas finding that, okay, no, I have done enough, can feel really difficult. And sometimes you need somebody to point it out for you, for you to start to say, oh, yeah, okay, actually, maybe I should be proud of that. Mm -hmm. So um, I often find, like, Reese and I do this, like, little question thing as well before we go to bed. What are you grateful for? What are you proud of? What would you do differently? Let's go. Um, and when we started doing it, he would always be like, I don't have anything I've been proud of. What are you talking about? Like, I just went to work and came home. Mm -hmm. um, so... If you aren't in the pattern of it, it can require someone else to be like, well, what about when you did this or when you did yeah. this? Um, so if you are listening and you think, well, I wouldn't even be able to, th to think about it, maybe try it with your friend or your partner or anybody that you could trust and have a chat with and, and ask their ideas of what you do well. Yeah, nice. Can like plant the seed and then you could ask yourself, hey, Sophie said that I did that last time. Like maybe did I do that today? Mm -hmm. And just give you some ideas because I think it is a really hard jump to make. It is. And it also like really connects like even like our experience when we were young, like if our parents were quite like critical of our yeah. behavior and stuff and kind of really pointed out our flaws, like we get really used to that in our brain. And then rarely they might have said, like, I'm really proud of you for doing this thing. And it's something like you can gradually teach the brain to become comfortable with a scenario like that where you talk to talk to someone else about it and get them to help you identify it is good. And it's just such an important mindset shift to have of like, Telling yourself, I've not done enough. I need to be bigger in my career. I need to make more money. Mm -hmm. I understand the motive. It's great to have a big career and make lots of money. Like That's, of course, great. But I genuinely believe you're much more likely to actually get there if you celebrate the progress because your brain's going to start thinking in much more of like a positive way about your work and about what you're doing in your life rather than this, oh, I have to do more, I have to do more. Yeah. It's, like a, it's like a hard negative energy to have inside you rather than like a positive, I can keep dreaming and keep dreaming and yeah. like keep reinforcing positivity as you go. <laughs> Ever wondered why losing weight seems so hard after you hit 30? You're not alone. At Body Smart, we specialize in helping women like you over the age of 30 to lose 30 to 60 pounds in less than six months, guaranteed. And that's without restrictive diets or endless hours in the gym. Our approach works because it's delivered through customized, direct one-on-one -on -one coaching. Your coach will tailor a fully personalized plan that fits into your life, focusing on sustainable habits, not temporary fixes. On average, our clients lose five to 10 pounds a month, and that's not an outlier. That's what you can expect to achieve month in, month out. And yes, these results are guaranteed. Ready to see for yourself? Visit bodysmartfitness.com to apply. Remember, we're here exclusively for women over 30 who are serious about taking charge of their health. Apply at bodysmartfitness.com. I, I don't know, I go back and forth with that sometimes because, mm -hmm. you know, um, who did I hear say this? But they were like, they were basically someone had done a challenge and they're like, oh, how do I keep up this initial motivation? And he was like, 
Yeah, just have a, a deep crippling insecurity that you're never going to be good enough at absolutely anything, and that'll just keep the fire raging, so you just keep doing more. <laughs> and it was like, that was like, he was like joking, but obviously talking about himself, and this other guy had obviously done a challenge and been successful, but wanted to keep doing more, and this was in the sort of business side of things. And it's like, a lot of the people I have witnessed who get revered as like the top, or the peak of success in society, success, and I'm not saying it's success in terms of, I don't think many people would trade places with them, like a Tiger Woods, top businessmen, a lot of people probably in Fortune 500. A lot of them are, unfortunately, you know, even like Will Smith, a lot of these guys like driven by like horrible insecurity mm -hmm. to just be more, do more, be more, do more to yeah. the point of like they will just relentlessly work because there's just this not enoughness that is driving them. Like that's the, the, the negativity is the fuel. Yeah, um, 100%. That, and it almost feels like it can't get, get put out. I, so the other side where I do agree with it is a lot of our clients start with that. But, and I think it's not a bad thing because they use the negativity as the, the fuel to get mm. them going. It's all right for it to be there at the beginning. 100%. Yeah, but over time we need to reach It's like it. the fire lighter. Yeah, it's the fire lighter. Yeah, because you, you, you can, people can view like depression, anxiety, all these like words as like negative, but like it, it's there for a reason. You know what I mean? And sometimes you can use some of these things that you're feeling as a positive thing. Uh, like step to get you going. But I do think like with, you know, what we say with clients over time, they need to shift that away. So you, so you're not just keep focusing on the negative energy to get you to that next step. I think that is so true. And all of those conversations <laughs> I had in the quiet, the initial yeah. ones were stop taking loads of drugs and drinking. And they mm. were conversations I had to hear. So like mm. negativity for me as well, also fueled it. So I think negativity a hundred percent has its place. I just think also reinforcing your reinforcing the positive behavior actually really motivates you because mm. you start realizing all the good like and you can answer whatever you feel the answer to this question yeah. is but with your business for example mm. you've helped many women in order to lose weight live healthier lifestyles feel happier all that kind of stuff do you find it more motivating to think like if you if you were falling asleep like if you really thought about all the women you've really helped and you thought like shit look at all the progress they've made and you like went down a real positive reinforcement of like wow body smart is doing like loads of good stuff for these women and went down that lane of thinking in your head or we're not doing enough we're not doing enough which lane do you think you wake up with more motivation to help women they're like we're not doing enough or the wow we, this is really fucking working and all these women are getting help and that's like actually like rewarding for them which is more motivating. Yeah. And like, well, I actually yeah, yeah. don't know the answer. Yeah, it's, fair. Um, it's I, I think at the moment, it's like one of the things I do is uh, I check read our trust pilots every day. So yeah. like, uh, that's one of the things that there is part of one of my Saturday tasks because it's like a ground and exercise for me because I'm quite out of like the day-to-day -day of like coaching nowadays or what some of the team is doing. That, that's like a really nice ground and exercise. And then we also do a point of celebrating that inside of Slack. So we tag the person who helped generate the lead and then the coach and the client services. So it's a really great way of just like celebrating the team as well. Mm -hmm. um, and th that's great. You know what I mean? Like that keeps me like mission focused and purpose focused to an extent. But then on the other side of it, um, yeah, there's, a, there's definitely these other drivers of just like, there's lots of people to help and stuff. Yeah, there's that side of it. And then there's also just like push, 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 not enough, better, better, better. You know, there's that, uh, that side a, of it That's too. a Jamie thing, not a more women to help thing though. That's Jamie. Yeah. What do you yeah. find more motivating when you're reading your trust pilot? Reading a, uh, a one-star review or a five-star review? Oh, a, fi a five-star review. Yeah, you know what I mean? Because that, that, that's positive. Yeah, yeah. Whereas I'm, like you got in our head, are we give it like, are we positively reviewing ourselves or negatively reviewing ourselves and which one's going to motivate us more? Yeah. And the celebration it, of achievement it, is, it, is like a positive review. It's like, nice, I have been eating healthier. I have been getting outside. Yeah, yeah. Whereas if it's like, I'm a fucking piece of shit. It's like, that's a negative review. And oh, it's yeah. just going to lead to that being what continues. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't fully know the answer. It's, it's, there's it's, a fine it's line. Tough. Like yeah, it's it definitely is, yeah. not that you should be only positive. Of course. But we, yeah. I feel like we're so tipped towards negative. Yeah. That we need mm -hmm. more of the like positive reinforcement. Yeah. Well, that's brain. why you can have, what am I proud of? And also what would I do differently? Yeah. Or what could I do? That's differently? a nice balance. That's good. Mm -hmm. Cause that's recognizing there's always room for growth, but mm -hmm. you also have to say that you did something good too. Yeah, 100%. You're not allowed to skip that question. A little bit of critique <laughs> and honesty is important. <laughs> okay, so oxytocin, definitely, definitely important, even though dopamine is maybe a bit more sexy at the moment and trending. The, th the thing is, is like when I'm looking at these chemicals, we train them in this order of dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, endorphins, yeah. partly because it's ridiculously convenient that it spells dose. <laughs> and uh, how the world didn't build a product like that before, I don't understand. Like I spotted those letters like four years ago, Googled it, and it's like, what? How has someone not built that? Um, 
But dopamine is the motivating chemical. And in order to do all the stuff, to bother to connect with your partner, hug them, eat the healthy food for serotonin, exercise for the endorphins, drive is what you need. So I, I really think it's useful to try and get the dopamine going. Right. Because then you're going to like be in a more like action oriented state that's going to then do the other things. Yeah. So solving the like more addictive behavior and getting a little bit more natural dopamine into your life is then going to lead to a brain that's like, oh, I should actually connect with my partner more and I should get more sleep and all that kind of stuff. So dopamine first, but 100% the others need to be boosted. Yeah. So that brings us on to serotonin, which you mentioned earlier is mm-hmm. actually not a brain one. It's a mm-hmm. gut one. Yeah. So it's made both in the gut and the brain. Right. But 90% is made within the gut. And as I say, there's a very clever, clever mechanism measuring the amount within your gut and the general state of your entire body, how your body's breathing, the food that's coming into it, how much rest the body has had, how much sunlight the skin has had. And then it's assessing and it's creating this serotonin chemical within the body. And if there's a high level of serotonin, our mood is going to be really stable. Our energy levels are going to be really stable. And if there's a low level of serotonin, low, like much more fluctuating mood, much more anxiety, much lower crashing energy levels. Okay, so there's a lot of things that you mentioned there, which is kind of just like, it sounds like a healthy lifestyle mm-hmm. is the way to look after this. Yeah, angle. I would take it through the order of morning sunlight, ridiculously important for it right. to boost. It's very hard to actually have much serotonin in our brain if we don't see sunlight in the morning. Like if we go straight from our office to like our bedroom to an office, that's very difficult for our serotonin system to like get itself activated. And then the next thing is the gut health, which like this audience will be very familiar with all the as like a nutrient comes into your body. If like like an ultra processed food comes into the body and there's this really interesting study like there's this uh, psychologist called Lane who's done this massive, massive assessment of ultra processed food against depressive symptoms in the brain. And like it's very clear that ultra processed food is causing a lot of the mental health difficulty. That and social media, I reckon, are the two biggest things in the Mm -hmm. world, UPF and social media. And when the ultra processed food enters the body, because it's like full of all these very unnatural chemical compounds, it enters the body and the body perceives it as a toxin. And whilst like as it comes in, huge dopamine stimulation, like, oh, my God, this is so delicious. When it processes through, you often feel crap. You feel crashed, your energy drops and your mood drops. And that's because it enters the body. And all these like serotonin microbes that are sitting there like, right, what, what nutrients are we getting today to build serotonin? It's something like, holy shit, what is that? And then like building serotonin is the last of its priorities and figuring out how the hell we're going to get this toxin through the body is the priority. So when crappy food turns up, it's very hard to build serotonin. But then when you eat fruits and natural foods and fish and like omega-3 and all that kind of stuff, when like good nutrients come into the body, it's like nice. These are the building blocks. These are, these are the resources for us to yeah. make Yeah, and serotonin. omega-3 is actually really important, isn't it, for serotonin? Ridiculously and important, yeah. yeah. Fish, fish, like good quality fish, really important. Fruit is really, really important. If you're worried about like sugar spikes, having fruit with like a good fat sauce, like yogurt or, or something protein. is obviously really good. Or protein yeah. is great. Um, but yeah, sunlight, gut health. And then we have the things like being in natural environments is absolutely insane for serotonin. Mm-hmm. Japan is really like the pioneering country that have discovered that. Great psychologist there called Jin Park who started this whole forest bathing movement in oh, yeah. Japan who like got loads of people into nature. And like you see massive increases in serotonin levels. And uh, then the big one is sleep. So you've kind of got like being outside natural environments, eating healthy food and getting lots of sleep, which is obviously so basic. Mm. But it's really Mm. three things that we're massively struggling with as a society. Like we're eating a lot of crap food. We spend all our time inside and we're on our phone. all Yeah. So it's like really important chemical to think about. It's really interesting because actually if you look at a lot of our clients habits that they're set, it would be get seven to nine hours sleep. Go for a walk every day and mm-hmm. eat 80% whole foods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that will absolutely smash yeah. their serotonin up. And then they will feel like you you say a lot of people feel like they're in a better mood and they have higher energy and stuff like that. And whilst like the goal can be like losing weight and getting into healthier physique, which is going to be really good, there's these amis- additional like huge mental health benefits that are going to occur because of yeah. serotonin, because of those behaviors. But it does sound really basic. And sometimes when you set that for somebody, they're like, how is this going to help me lose weight like what why are we talking about my sleep i just need to eat less Mm. (laughs) but you have to get all these things in alignment for you to then be able to make those rational choices right and not be pulled around by your dopamine desires or whatever because you feel like you've got this steady baseline and everything then feels easier to do definitely and just to really understand that with sleep sleep is one of the primary behaviors that's going to build this serotonin molecule like you're lying there 
your body is in this deep state of rest where your heart rate is slower and it's like, oh, we're asleep right now. That's a really good serotonin manufacturing time where we'll use the nutrients we ate today to sit there whilst there's less cognitive stuff happening. We'll sit and make a load of serotonin. If you get a load of sleep, then you wake up in the morning, you've got high serotonin levels. A body with high serotonin is then going to seek for healthier food more because mm. it's going to be like, oh yeah, how did we get all that serotonin yesterday? Because the body is so clever. It's such an intelligent mm. machine. And then it wakes up and it's more likely to crave like fruit or protein or yogurt or whatever it might be. Whereas if it's waking up really low serotonin, you're in this shit mood, then our brains go towards that. How do I get out of this shit mood? And then we all choose dopamine. So we go sugar mm. and stuff like that. Yeah, so it's big. interesting. Sleep is really big for your desire to eat the healthy food effectively yeah okay so sleep whole foods sunlight, sunlight. nature why i don't because i feel like this has been like only like the past couple of years people have started talking about morning sunlight and getting sunlight yeah, yeah human really yeah made yeah, it yeah. Famous, it didn't it? yeah it's kind of put it put it out there but like that is something that typically like wasn't maybe because about. before covid most people did at least leave the house <laughs> like, but you, I remember those times. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. How many people haven't gone back to work in the office five days? Yeah, a week? I wonder like, what. I, they don't even need to walk to the car. They well, literally just yeah. go downstairs. Mm. And that's definitely got. Like, like, I, I think that's like a net. I know a lot of people do prefer working from home and everything else. But sometimes I feel like th there's definitely a percentage of the population that's been a net negative for. Mm. Like mm -hmm. maybe the only thing they did get up and get dressed. You know, these things we were saying about before, brushing your teeth would be good, getting dressed to go to the workplace, doing that drive to work. Effort. And effort, yeah, to go and do that. Now you roll out in your pyjamas and you turn your laptop on. Mm. And oh, it stresses yeah, yeah. me the thought of people waking and going straight onto Zoom. It really does. And yeah. that's what like so many people do. And it doesn't stress me. Like I'm not judging it. It's just like, that's not good for humanity. Yeah, for it's, not, it's, not good, it's not good for you. You're the no. that person who, who they're doing it for. And, it, you know, so that's, that's definitely been a, a big shift. Mm -hmm. Um, the morning so, sun, I think, is really, really significant. Like, always coming back to hunter-gatherers because that's why we got these brain chemicals. Mm -hmm. Like, obviously, we woke up to the sunlight every single day for 300,000 years, and we have that circadian rhythm, just like the clock that's mm -hmm. living within our body. And if it starts fast, like, if, if the circadian rhythm spikes quickly at the beginning because it gets a load of sunlight and we get energetic really fast, it means at the end of the day, it drops really fast and we fall asleep really quickly. Mm. But if we stay inside all morning, our energy system starts really, really slowly. And just like any curve, if it goes up slowly, <coughs> then it goes down really slowly. Mm. And people struggle, like, lying in bed and they think loads and they worry loads. And that is directly connected to whether you get morning mm. sunlight. Yeah. I heard someone say, yeah, one of the best ways to, like, just reset your circadian rhythm is, like, Go camping for a week without your phone. Oh, I mean, <laughs> if the whole world could just go camping this weekend without their phone, <laughs> um, like the world would be a different place next week. Like yeah. it genuinely would. Everyone would feel completely different. Yeah. It's so, just a bit of a, a sad question here. So, like in the summers and the winters, then would you typically sleep more and sleep less because of, oh, the, especially in the UK? Yeah. yeah, naturally. Yeah, you would, and and the brain has adapted to get the serotonin off different things. Like in in the summer, a large proportion of our serotonin production is going to come from sunlight and being outside. Hopefully, so that's why it feels so good when you just like feel the sun. Yeah, your body is literally your feeling the vitamin D and going like, oh, oh. sunlight builds serotonin. Sunlight builds serotonin. Like that is what it's doing with the sun, and. In the winter months, we might not get as much sun, but we can often, if we like sleep with like good alignment to the sun, we get more sleep in the winter. So it'll be like sunlight in the summer for serotonin and sleep in the winter oh, for serotonin, for sure. It's like a little tag team. Yeah, whereas the, what can happen because we're like in such an artificial world is really indoor in the summer. So don't go outside in the daytime, don't get sunlight. And then in the winter, loads of technology and screens, so don't get much sleep. So both of them are like out yeah. of the filter. And this is why like, these, these, so thi whack, yeah. these things are all why we have yeah. low mood, depression, yeah. all these kind of emotions. And just to summarize, what is it that serotonin actually does if it's in balance again? Low mood and low energy levels. Okay. So if the mood is low, like if you feel kind of like your mood is going up, feel great, and then suddenly feeling quite low, that's a really good indication. Worrisome thinking, really clear sign, which is often connected to low mood. Like when you're low, you might notice yourself worry more. So if you're worrying or you feel tired, mm. that basically means low serotonin. Okay. I've seen um, a couple of things. And again, they're just social media reels. So how real they are because it's Dr. So-and-so. Yeah. Who knows? But they're basically saying that um, if you take a course on antibiotics, it can really disrupt the serotonin in your gut for like up to six to 12 months. And mm -hmm. you know, people who are taking, uh, you know, antibiotics multiple times a year are more likely to have a depressive episode within like the really? next sort of 12 months. I It was a real, but I was like, mm, kind of makes sense. Like thinking about like what antibiotics do, they go into the gut and they just destroy nuke everything. It, yeah, nuke yeah. it, yeah. yeah. Um, is there any truth to, to that? 
again, like always with medications because the world we live in and I'm not a psychiatrist, I have to be conscious. If you are struggling with like a really significant illness, take the antibiotics because yeah. they're great for that. But 100%, like if, if you had like a low level illness and then you're just like taking antibiotics because it's a quick solution, then that isn't good because the microbes themselves in the gut are what sit there and generate the serotonin. So if you mm. nuke the whole microbes, I haven't read that research paper from that yep. doctor, but like from a logic standpoint, if you nuke all the microbes that are sitting there building it, obviously there's none mm. to build it. So like you are very likely to go through a low after that. Yeah. So it's just weighing it up. And the other thing is, just like antibiotics, we've also discovered the whole probiotic world with yeah. kefir and kombucha mm. and like sauerkraut and all these things that are really rich in probiotics. And I had to take an antibiotic like a year ago. I got like a cut in my neck and I had to get taken out. And I was like stressing out about taking antibiotics because I don't really do medication. And during it, I just made like a really conscious effort to probiotic my body as hard as I could. So whilst that lot were getting nuked, a whole <laughs> new world were getting built effectively. Mm. So there's yeah. solutions. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, so that brings us on to the last of the four, mm -hmm. endorphins, yeah. which we, we talk about you know, mm. with exercise. Yeah. Um, but one thing that you mentioned earlier, I think is really interesting, is it's also related to pain. Yes. How mm. does that work? Because I don't think, I think people well, hear it and go, exercise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So exercise is like completely correct that we associate yeah. it so much with endorphins. We didn't evolve endorphins to make us motivated to exercise. Exercise was just happening naturally. But we evolved them so that if we were in extreme physical or psychological danger, they would release to help us survive that situation. And Say, for example, the scenario of like, actually, you're walking through a forest and 20 meters over there, there's a bear. So you're like, hey, I'm dead if that bear gets to me, effectively. You need a mechanism that's going to enable you to sprint basically as fast as you can for two miles without stopping in order to try and get away from it. And if right now I said to you guys, like, leave here and run to the station two miles at like your absolute top speed, it's very likely that you'd be running. You'd be like, oh, I got a stitch. I got physical pain in my body. But if there was actually a bear behind you, <laughs> you'd very likely find a way to keep running. You'd yeah. just keep running. And endorphins were basically, the harder we physically pushed ourselves, the more endorphins would release to help us cope with that situation. Not only do they help us cope with the pain, they help us cope with the stress of the experience as well. And that's why when you exercise, you might notice, oh, I feel a bit less stressed about that situation that I was in, like with work or something, mm. post-exercise. And that's very related to endorphins release particularly when you physically work hard like on the last reps of a set or when you're sprinting on a treadmill or you're swimming as fast as you can in those moments pain relief for the body de-stress for the brain which is super valuable yeah amazing yeah. and I've, the harder you work out the more it's in the moments where you are running away from the bear that they release so like it's just like in those final like any anything that's movement based will release them like if you go for a walk you will get like a small endorphin release for sure but if you're going for a walk and then there was a hill and you're like oh, i'm just going to sprint up this 40 meter hill you'd suddenly get this rush of endorphins because your body would be like oh shit there could be a bear behind me because it doesn't know mm. like why we suddenly take these random actions because everything originally was just purely instinctive like a hunter-gatherer wouldn't walk along and just suddenly run fast as they can, <laughs> 40 meters. There'd be a reason they were running fast. And little moments of hard physical exertion, even if like you absolutely hate exercise, but you could go on a walk and have a little moment where you run, like that's going to create a little uh, release of them. Yeah, I've, I would say um, I, I definitely found that. I feel like most people's problems, and I'm not trying to downplay anyone, could honestly be solved by like a difficult workout, especially if you haven't mm. been working out like regularly. Like yeah. you just go and do a couple of hard workouts this week. And I, I feel like it's like your problems are still there. But instead of them being like a nine, they just feel like a three. So you're like, you're, mm. you're still aware, you're like your problems are still there. They just don't feel as like, I, I don't know what the exact intense word is. Or... Intense, yeah. Like you're still aware. You're just like, okay, like I'll deal with that. And, and your it, capacity to solve it from that headspace is also much better. Yeah. But when we're really highly stressed, got loads of cortisol in our body, the stress hormone, it's then like we're solving it from like a fearful place mm. and we make poor decisions in like discussions in relationships or discussions with our boss. Whereas if you like really de-stress the brain, then approach mm. the situation. Like if yeah. I did have a really big argument with like a partner or someone in my work, it'd be so much better to go mm. and exercise, then try and solve it rather than in the heat of the cortisol, like yeah. try and solve it then. Yeah. We have I've like actually seen a thing where it's like, if you're having a row with your partner, go both go and do 10 burpees and then continue the round. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, from an endorphins point of view, there's logic there. Yeah. There is. Uh, yeah, I've, I think we had like a couple of really negative things happen in work. Like someone was leaving, like th like three big bombshells went off, which was like not rare to happen. And then someone was going to me, you all right? And I was like, you know what? I've done a five minute cold bath and a leg workout where I killed myself this morning. So I was like, <laughs> I feel like I can handle pretty much the world right now. Mm. I was just like, yeah, this is chip. We'll just like sort of deal with it. And I do feel like that the regular exercise makes just dealing with life so mm. much easier sometimes. Yeah. And it's all about thinking about like 
and it's very motivating. Like, how will I feel after the experience of the exercise? Because mm. I understand going and doing the exercise isn't necessarily that fun. Maybe if you love exercise, but for a lot of people, it's like, fuck, I've got to go and do some exercise. And you have a really stressful day at work. And what we'd often seek for is like artificial presence and pleasure, which we know if we come home and drink wine and go on our phone, like mm. the pain will, the problem won't be there for the period that we're drinking the wine on the, and the being on mm. the phone. Whereas like, if I have a really stressful day, although like the thought of like, oh, fuck, I've got to go to the gym isn't what I want to do. I know when I finish the gym, I'll be able to not use the phone and the alcohol and I will feel less stressed out. Yeah. And it's like all about thinking after. Like even this morning I woke up and I was like, I can't really be bothered to work out in this hotel. Like we can't have to just lie in bed and chat. Like obviously that'd be more fun and get some oxytocin. And instead, <laughs> instead like we were like, right, let's do a work because I want to feel good for this podcast and have my brain yeah. clear and stuff like that. So mm. it's just like thinking, what is it going to do after the mm-hmm. experience? It's really important. Yeah. And it's not just workouts. Yeah. So there's four other things that will have a, a big impact. Anytime you put yourself in a hot environment, a bath or a sauna, you get what's called a heat stress response, which again leads to endorphin release. Our brain doesn't necessarily know that that bath isn't going to get really hot or the sauna's not going to get really hot. So it pre-prepares. Oh. oh shit, they might be about to go into physical pain. Let's release the endorphins. Obviously saying that, don't make your sauna ridiculously hot or your bath <laughs> ridiculously hot because that's just going to damage you and like cause a problem. So you've got hot environments great. Singing music out loud, ridiculously good for an endorphin release. Wow. Like it puts the body, the chest through like a physical effort, pain type experience where it's having to work. And you'll notice like, if you're singing in your car and you're on your own, you think... Shit, I quite like this. Like, and you're telling yourself, like, I'm actually quite a good singer. Maybe I could have been a singer. The, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that experience is quite euphoric and euphoria is very yeah. endorphin related. So you've got exercise, heat, music, and then laughter, super powerful. If you really laugh, you'll notice it literally hurts your body. And the final one is stretching our body. So exercise, heat, music, laughter, stretching. Those five, insane. And you don't need to do all of them. You just one or two. Would be so you great. could do like hot laughter yoga people do shit like that though and the fact that humans have even come up with that is probably because of our deep instinctive understanding of endorphins and like we've invented something that creates the most significant release in the chemical yeah and uh, do you know what actually because i'm a yoga teacher i absolutely love all of the incantations and you know any of the chants you do just get this feeling Mm. and i'm not religious and it doesn't the words don't mean anything to me but it is that like being in a room with other people and Mm. like all of the vibrations and you're making the sound yourself it is an amazing feeling yeah i mean scenarios like that like humans used to come together and make music together that was like a big thing religious practices have always done it thousands of years humans have done that and like that act is like extremely dose because you're really concentrating so you get loads of dopamine you're connecting with people so you get oxytocin serotonin also connects into our breathing pattern so if you're breathing slowly which you have to do to sing and then endorphins you're literally making sound so you're like seriously hard dosing yourself if you're singing with a wow. group basically that's super cool yeah so if you can sing with a group sing in the car with your family or something or i love sing it so actually then we this is a good way to end we've talked about how everybody is fucking up their life with <laughs> yeah. everything and yeah. just to confirm yeah. i also fucked my life for 10 yeah. years yeah. um if you could give someone like five simple steps to unfuck their life yeah that would that's a good question so yeah. this evening you're going to make sure your bedroom looks tidy and organized so you're going to make sure your bedroom looks nice and you're going to go to bed like 30 minutes earlier than typically would so whatever it takes 30 minutes earlier than you typically would then you're going to wake up in the morning and you're going to make sure that you make your bed and see sunlight before social media so you're going to try and make the end of your day today and your morning tomorrow a hell of a lot better and a more natural process for your system than usual and then that day you're going to observe whether you feel any different if you feel different make sure you do it again and again and again and celebrate that you did it yeah and, and be like celebrate. fuck yeah so i actually did something that was hard it was hard to resist my phone and i did it so that's an important thing yeah. to celebrate and it is those baby steps, isn't it? You can't you can't start by optimizing all this stuff. You've got to just make that first. Mm. If the end of the day routine is good, like people like on Insta, like watching social media. Oh, look at that evening routine. Look at that morning routine. <laughs> the reason we instinctively like it is because yeah. we've all got shit morning and evening <laughs> routine. Yeah, yeah. And if if the and if you look at any high performing like positive happy human, that is the thing that they've nailed down. They've mm. always nailed down their evenings and their mornings. And if you change that system, you start ending the day well, starting the day well, big shifts then happen with the rest of your life. Big shifts, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice. So um, we could probably carry on for another two hours, but I'm sure people have got things to do and places to be. So if people do want to hear more about Mm -hmm. all of the work you're doing, where can they go to find out more? Yeah. So TJ Power on Instagram. Instagram is my main platform. And then 
I have a, uh, a book coming out called The Dose Effect in January, which is going to like label this all out and make it super easy to follow this path to getting all these chemicals optimized. Yeah, it sounds like it's going to be a really good read. Can't wait. Buzz. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming down. Yeah, cheers. Thanks for having me, guys. Anytime. <laughs> Wow, that was such a great chat. We could have talked to TJ for hours. If you loved hearing about the mindset shifts that are possible, you'll definitely enjoy episode 77 as well with mindset expert Maya Raichora.